at 631, I will call tonight's meeting to order. And I'll start by talking about meeting logistics for a couple of minutes. Anyone who's joining remotely, please change your uh, name display to your first and last name. And anyone who uh, is addressing the council, please start by stating your name and where you live. We ask your, you to keep your comments to under three minutes, and we will have to find someone new to uh, be the timekeeper. Uh, uh, and excellent here, we have Evelyn to be the yeah. timekeeper. This video right. Show. And we'll be able to see that. Excellent. Um, anyone speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your comments both brief and germane to the topic at hand. Anyone who wishes to speak must uh, be recognized by the mayor and uh, you can be reeled in if you speak out of term, turn, discuss non-germane topics or go on too long. And with that, it's time to approve the agenda. I also have a remote member who should- Oh, sorry, thank you. And Lauren, would you uh, identify yourself? Yep, Lauren Hurl here with District 1. Thank you. Um, looking at the agenda, we uh, uh, Katie Trouts is not available tonight, so we will uh, delete I item six, the eclipse update. Uh, we have a couple of meetings coming before the eclipse, eclipse happens, so we'll be able to uh, cover that uh, <clears throat> at a future meeting. And uh, I've been told that there may be uh, people here to discuss the uh, zoning uh, amendment, public hearing. And so if it turns out that there are a lot of people here for that, then we might move that up uh, earlier in the agenda, the agenda. But for now, I'm not seeing a big uh, crowd. And with that, if there are no objections, I'll consider the uh, amend the agenda to be approved. Next on the agenda, it's listed as swearing in of new council member, member Gill but we also have two other council members and a mayor to swear in. And I'll turn that over to the city clerk. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you, first of all, for your indulgence in uh, putting up with me being remote. It solves certain logistical problems with my 20 year old. So, um, and um, Adrian was already sworn in, but if you want to be sworn in for the pictures, <laughs> then you're welcome to, but I just need to first of all swear in Sal and Carrie. So if you you're, are you're, pa you're passing on this opportunity, Adrian. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, if Sal and Carrie would stand up and raise your right hand, there are two oaths. I, rem I remind you, so don't sit down too quickly. All right. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution or government thereof, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of council member for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. I do. All right, you all are duly sworn in. And now I just have one more to go. Okay. So I don't see you, Jack, but I'm assuming you're standing. Ah, now I see you. All right. Do you solemnly affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution or government thereof under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Do you solemnly affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of mayor for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. All right. Congratulations, all. Okay, thank you. And congratulations to everyone who was elected and reelected. Uh, it's time now for general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council 
on any topic that is not on the uh, on tonight's agenda. We uh, again request that you keep your comments to three minutes. And I see Peter Kelman, you have your hand raised. Peter Kalman, I live in Mountain View Street in uh, Montpelier. Uh, I just want to say that I've been to a couple of meetings now after taking some time off. It's getting more and more difficult to find the link to these meetings. Uh, I, I went to the main page where it says click on this, click here to uh, get the agenda, join the meeting. It's not, not active. Uh, uh, I, I've complained in the past about the website. And I'll continue to complain about the website. It's not user-friendly. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. And if you notice, there's very few people here uh, uh, remotely. And last time I was here, there were also very few people remotely. I really would ask Evelyn and the tech people to take a look and to make it really easy to get to find the city council meetings, if not all sorts of other things. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Anybody else um, seeking to be recognized? I will pause for a moment to make sure that everyone has the time to be heard. I'm not seeing anybody. Um, so we can move to uh, the consent agenda. Is there any uh, request to take items off the consent agenda? Okay, then the chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. Next up, we have appointments to the Conservation Commission and the Homelessness Task Force. Um, I do not see any of the applicants online, but if I, if if you're here and I just didn't see you, please uh, let us know. Okay, folks, what's your pleasure? We could, we can uh, entertain a motion to go into executive, uh, Carrie. So I will move that we appoint Jazz Smith and Joanne Garten to the Conservation Commission and Beverly Allen to the Homelessness Task Force. Is there a second? Uh, I will second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. Next, we have item nine, election of officers. Mr. Chair, your appointed order, your, all your front doors are locked. You can't hold an open meeting with the, with the doors locked. Is the back door unlocked? I found that afterwards, but I missed mm -hmm. it. It's not sufficient. The next item on the agenda is election of officers. We have uh, to elect the council president, council vice president, and parliamentarian. Are there any nominations? Terry. I'll nominate Lauren Hurl for council president. Are there any other nominations for council president? Okay, all those in favor of uh, Lauren Hurl for council president, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, next up, uh, council vice president. You are allowed to nominate yourself and, and you can also nominate anyone else. I would nominate Carrie Brown if she wants it. <laughs> are, are you willing to do it? I am, yes. Any other nominations? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
And finally, parliamentarian, the most fun job of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any nomination for parliamentarian? All just at once. Right. <laughs> Jack has been our... <laughs> Terry. Yeah, I'm I'm the current parliamentarian, which probably nobody realizes since there's not much to do as a parliamentarian and I'm not an expert, but it's a great position for learning about Robert's rules of order and meeting procedures. Um so I'm I would nominate Sal if you would be interested in doing that cuz I some something just tells me you might be interested. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a blast. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody want to fight Sal for the job? <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And anyone opposed? Okay. Next up, we have uh, adoption of the rules of procedure. The rules of procedure have been uh, published in, in the council packet. And uh, so it, it, the floor would be open to for a motion to readopt the rules of procedure as uh, as they are now, or to uh, uh, propose any amendments. I'm not hearing any proposals of amendments. So would someone like to make a motion to readopt the current rules? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Next up, we are to ethics policy, and we are um, same thing here. Bill, do you want to give a little introduction? Uh, just that. Uh, we have had this ethics policy for a long time. I'm not going to go through it all, but I would advise everyone to read this. There are times when there are conflicts of interests or apparent conflicts of interests, and uh, you know, being good stewards of public process is important for us to maintain high ethical standard. I was actually at the state house yesterday. There's a movement afoot to have a statewide code of ethics for municipal employees for municipal officials. Uh, but at this point, there is a state requirement that we have an ethics policy. We Ours actually predates that requirement, which is great. But um, I think it, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's served us well, uh, but certainly um, is, is worth reading over. And uh, I am always available. We can get help from the League of Cities and Towns if there's any questions uh, and uh, our attorneys. So if you ever are struggling even before a meeting, should I address this or not? Always happy to talk that over. So it's important that we get this right. Okay. Is there a motion to readopt the ethics policy? Awesome. And is there a second? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And anyone opposed? Okay, next up we are to standards and group norms. And I'm sorry, in? sure. So these are all great um, and they've served us well. I will say that they, they were developed by a prior council of now of whom none of none are sitting. And um, it was done at a retreat. So if if we choose to have some sort of retreat and this is the sort of thing that you'd like to discuss, how you operate together and come up even if they end up being the same, come up with them that are your own that you've reached, then you might want to table this or you can adopt this until such time or, or not. But they were, it was done at a time when the council was having a little bit of difficulty working together. And so they sat down at a retreat to figure out some sort of rules of engagement. And that's what they came up with. And it's it's been good. But I think it's better when it's the group that's doing it has reached them on their own and looked each other in the eye and said, this is how we agree to function. But I just want to mention that. I think that's a great idea, Bill. Um, we have scheduling a retreat on the agenda uh, later tonight. What, everyone feel good about pushing that off until then, until we have a retreat is when we do. 
Cool. Committee assignments. All right. <laughs> no. I'm I'm told to remind people in the warrant book. There's also the loan documents are in the. Yeah, I think Sal's got them. So that's probably the most important thing of all to sign, because they're one of them is on a very short turnaround time. So Adrian, if, uh, Adrian, yeah, this is. You've just approved these things in the consent agenda, so now they need council signatures. So it just goes around. So. so most of us have been through this before. We have this uh, list of all these uh, city commit committees. Many of us might not have known until we were elected that part of the job was not only to come to these meetings, but to be member of other meetings. <laughs> exactly. That's right. The the bonus meetings that you get to go by being members of, of committees. Um, and so uh, the list of committees has been sent out and, and many people already have their assignments and it doesn't mean you have to stay on those committees, but uh, why don't we just go through them? Uh, the ADA Advisory Committee, um, one of those committees that meets during uh, regular business hours, and I was on it for a couple of years, and it's it's really pretty good. Sal, you're on it now. Yeah. And do you want to stay on it? Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody else who is interested in doing it? We We have this whole process, you know, the city is required to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and this committee is in charge of uh, reviewing essentially all the buildings and facilities of the city to ensure compliance with the ADA. And it's, of course, a many year process because a lot of it involves expensive capital improvements. Anybody else eager to get on it in addition to Sal? It's only quarterly. That's we true. <laughs> okay, Sal, good, good to go. The Building Code Appeals Committee. This is probably the easiest committee to be on, right? Hasn't met yet, so for me. So. There you go. There is a there is a provision in the Building Code where people can appeal the decision of the building inspector. Um, and this is the committee that hears those. It was pretty active in the days when we had uh, a requirement for residential uh, sprinklers and people were seeking waivers to that requirement. And so the, this committee, since the council repealed that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure they've ever met, but it is it is in our ordinance. It does need to exist in the event that somebody were to appeal it. Mm -hmm. So there's three people, two not two, a council member and two other folks. Have to stay on that. Okay. You too, Lauren. Okay. She's on it. Yep. Okay. Next up, the Capital Improvement Plan Committee. Current members include Carrie Brown, Lauren Hurl, and Tim Heaney. And I'm not on the committee. Does someone who's on it want to talk about what, what it does? Uh, I think I've been to one meeting. And we talk about the the funding for the capital plan. And I would like to stay on it. And that's about uh -huh. it. Yeah, so typically in this year, like a lot of things, um, we were compressed with time. Typically this committee does review the draft capital plan for not only the current year, but for going forward um, so that when it comes to the council as part of the budget, I mean, not that the council can't change it, but at least three council members have seen it and said, we recommend, you know, this going forward. Um, like I said, we were, everything was behind schedule this year. So we did have one meeting. The council did go through it. I think it would benefit from a couple of meetings uh, during budget time and, you know, maybe one, one other time of the year when there's less pressure on but it is not a you know monthly meeting or a weekly meeting or anything like that. Tim, are you interested in staying on it? Yes. <laughs> and Lauren, you too. Okay. I think we're and every 
with all these meetings, of course, everybody, everybody can go. Yeah. Um, cemetery commission. We are not represented at this point. No, we should. Go right. right. It's a separate, separate body. Yeah. Um, Central Vermont Regional Planning Transportation Committee. This is an important committee. Um, every every community in the region has a, a rep, and it is the group. And I'm, I'm looking at Mike to correct me when I go awry. But as I understand it, it takes the various transportation projects in the region and prioritizes them, uh, essentially. And so when funding comes from the state for transportation projects and they go to the regions, they go down the priority list. Is that it? Please, please. Mike Miller. So yeah, that's pretty accurate. It's, a, it's an important committee. They're a subcommittee of the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and they are usually separately staffed. So uh, for transportation related. So a, a lot of the federal money for transportation, it was all set up to travel kind of to the regional planning commission for prioritizing. It was just at the time the programs were all set up, they were kind of set up to skip the states and go to the regions. So that's why it's set up that way. And so we have a representative to, we actually appoint a commissioner to the regional planning commission, but then there is a separate representative to this transportation advisory committee. And it's, I think it's been, it was council member bait for a long time. So it is an important voice to have. I'd be interested in that. Um, Great. I probably know some of the people on transportation and I think that's important. So Great. I can sit on that committee. Great. Mr. Mayor, if I could just point out, I was looking at the list and I usually have to jump up. So I was ready to jump up and I see it's not on the list. So another ap appointment on the list is usually the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, mm -hmm. which is separate from the TAC. Mm -hmm. That is uh, a, usually a appointed as a member of the Planning Commission, which has been uh, Ariane Kassam for the past couple of years. And so as far as I know, she's still interested in being on that. So. Okay. It, well, it's usually go. an appointment that the council makes at this time. Everybody happy with maintaining the status quo there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, <clears throat> solid waste management. Uh, Lisa Stewart. Do we, yeah, she she is a resident who is our appointee to that, and actually a former executive director of that organization. Is a great. They are strongly advised that we keep, keep her, her on. Keep her on. Okay. Community Justice Committee. That's you now. Yes. I'll stay there if it is okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, if anybody is interested in, it's a um, community justice center, and we help them. Uh, with their programs, volunteers. We haven't met recently. After the flood, we changed the meeting times because of the emergency. So we haven't had uh, like new uh, settled date, but it is very important. Uh, the Community Justice Center creates so many um, beneficial programs for our community youth. So if anyone is interested in it, it would be great good to have another council member. But I want to say, yeah. Great. We could have more than one, but if if everyone's happy, okay. Community advisory board. Community advisory board of what? I think that's the CJC same thing. Advisory board. Yes. Okay. So these two things should go together. Uh huh. And the community fund board. Um, we don't usually have a council rep on that. Okay. Um, complete streets committee. There are these two committees that are kind of related, but they're not exactly the same. The complete streets committee and the, uh, transportation infrastructure committee, which I'm not sure I'm seeing on the list either. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, 
we just, I'm on the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and we just met last night and talked about actually uh, inviting liaisons between committees. We have several committees in mind, actually, but one, one of them is Complete Streets, so we'd have a representative at our meeting, and if they were interested, they would have a representative from us. So mm -hmm. um, it sounds like a good plan to me. That makes sense, uh, yeah. More coordination needed for that mm -hmm. stuff. And so, and it looks like we don't have a complete streets representative now, which if we don't, we don't. And, and we probably won't. If this liaison system gets up and running quickly, which we think it will, we won't need one because we'll be able, we'll get, we'll get input. Uh, we'll get a report from the liaison. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Conservation Commission. Again, we don't have a representative um, design review, same thing. Development review board, same thing. It's a quasi-judicial ju body appointed by the council. The Energy Advisory Committee. At present, we have Sal and Lauren as a backup. And you both willing, wanting to stay on? Stay there, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the Harry Sheridan Scholarship Com Committee. Now, we, when Ann Watson was here, it was considered to be a great thing for her to be there, given the fact that she teaches at the school. And I had the impression that maybe there was a fixed term for that uh, seat. Do you know? I I don't know. I do know that it involves giving a scholarship to a student in either Montpelier or U32 um, that has done civic things. And obviously, Ian, as both a council member and mayor, was a good person because she was already at the high school and knew the people. But we have had you know others do that prior to uh, Ian's time on the in this room. So yeah, I think it's a once or twice a year meeting at, you know, whenever they decide scholarships in yep. spring sometime. So if someone wants to be on it, I'd love to hear it. But I'm also, I think Anne is a perfect person to, to have serving in that role. Okay. Senior, Senior Activity Center Advisory Council. Do we usually have someone on that? There's nobody listed now. Okay. And Historic Preservation Commission, again, it's not something that we have a person on. Homelessness Task Force. Um, Tim, aren't you, aren't you on this too? No? Nope. Okay. But Pellin and Sal, you're, you're both on and you want to stay on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving right along, we have the Housing Committee. At present... Uh, Tim and Carrie are on it, and you're both interested in saying. Investment committee, Sal, you're on that. Does it uh, yeah. meet very often? It does not. I'll stay on it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Montpelier Life Board. Great. Yeah. Um, Parks Commission. This is something that uh, Donna was on. There. Okay. So, I think the Parks Commission is elected. I think we nominated Donna, or she volunteered to be a liaison from this council to the Parks Commission. She attended their meetings, but there's. A, the Parks Commission, as structured in the charter, is a five-person elected board. Um, so its question is, do we want to have an additional person attend? She had a lot of interest in that and chose to do that. I think the council, and they liked, I mean, it was good to have the liaison, but it's not a requirement. Yep. So I'll see if there's anyone who wants to uh, take that slot, but don't feel under an obligation. Okay. Um, 
Recreation Advisory Board. We don't have, oh, sorry, Public Art Commission. There have been years when we've had a member, but just not every year. Not seeing any takers. Recreation Advisory Board. I don't think we have them. Okay. We'll be interested in the recreation advisory Okay, board. there you go. Great. Yeah, we do. Okay. Restroom committee. Carrie, you're on that. And you want to stay on it? Yep. Great. And CJAC, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Carrie, you're on that. Is there anyone else who also wants to be on it? Because you don't, it doesn't have to be limited to one person. Okay. Sprinkler Variance Committee has needed and are we supposed to have someone on that? I don't think we even need to have that committee anymore. Because it, it never comes up, right. right? Well, we don't longer have the... We don't have the requirement. I think actually that in the building code appeals are the same, one and the same. Okay. Stormwater Utility Committee. Um, Tim and Lauren are on it, and Donna was on it. Um, I think it's fine if you guys both want to stay. Mm -hmm. Here's the Transfer Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Sal, you're on it. And I was on that for a couple of years, and it looks at all, pretty much all the alternatives to driving cars around the city to get places. So a lot of people who run are bicycle activists. And... I'd like to be on that too. Thank Great. you. Tree board, do we really have someone on that? It just, just exists. And the Wood Art Gallery board is the only board that is really designated for the mayor or the mayor's designee. And I am happy to stay on that, of course. All right. Good work, team. It seems like we got through this faster than we do sometimes. It may be that uh, giving it out in advance you know, helped. So I am going to suggest that we do the FEMA buyouts and the zoning before orientation. So let's move up to the FEMA buyout uh, presentation. Josh, is that you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you want? It? Should we do the zoning first? And I think so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, good evening, Mike Miller, planning director. So I'm not going to go through uh, another presentation unless people would like to have the, the presentation. Uh, I was just going to quickly update where we are. So we have online. Excuse me, Mike. Yes. I will call our public hearing to order. Okay. Or open the public hearing, I should say. All right. And so um, we obviously had um, a first public hearing uh, on the 14th of February, a second public hearing on the 28th, where we made uh, a number of smaller changes, but enough changes such that we are uh, we're required to go and have the Planning Commission provide comment. Uh, their comment uh, after meeting on Monday is that they agreed with all of your changes. The only note they wanted to make was they felt that we should, uh, the council should consider at some point having um, a review, a legal review of the shading requirement to make sure that it is actually a legal item, um, but that they are they're fine with how things were decided. Um, so between the last meeting on the 28th and today, um, online, there are updated copies of the draft zoning regulations. There's an updated copy of the map, which I gave you guys a final copy of. I didn't get it till this afternoon. There were back and forth on a number of small changes that um, needed to get cleaned up on the map. So that's all set now. Um, what 
changed from the 28th to the copy that is online and that you guys have access to now um, at your request. The So the zoning map for Country Club Road was updated. Um, we updated the map online and here. Uh, there was a discussion about potentially adding Steve Ribellini's parcel, which is um, if you were at the Country Club and looked across the road, there's a parking lot. The back of that parking lot uh, off into the woods is owned by uh, somebody else, Steve Ribellini. And so it's about a five acre piece. It's not really greatly developable. It's got a lot of steep slopes and pieces. But at the same time, it is uh, it is abutting and it is right there. And we have talked about potentially in the future, we might subdivide the parcel and sell pieces. So there, there would be a potential there that the city could consider going and saying, well, he has a little bit of developable land, but it's right next to a developable piece the city has. He might be the person that buys it, merges it with the rest of his lot, and therefore could participate with the same zoning designation that what we called urban residential. So... Uh, I did put those on the map, um, in the draft map. If people want that changed or don't want that in there, we can certainly vote to remove it back, to move it back. But I did put that one back in. And does uh, that potentially also bridge over to Sabin's pasture? Like if, if we keep going, no. Nope. No, it, does, it doesn't go, his his parcel okay. doesn't go far enough. Okay. No. But there is room for housing on it at the top part. It's got a sleep slope, but there, there could be, it could be integrated into the housing project with yeah. others. Yeah, it's just unlike unlike what we zoned for urban residential, it's all open and flat and very easy to develop. His parcel has some space that would be relatively easy to develop, but then also a large portion of it that's not easily developable. But that said, as we've been talking about, maybe subdividing or uh, selling portions off, he could certainly take his smaller piece, add it to a piece that's part of ours, and therefore be able to have a piece that would be developed within these within these rules. So uh, I thought it was a good idea. It was a good suggestion to add it in. So uh, I did put that in. Related to that, uh, there was a question about what other places might we consider urban residential? Uh, I looked at the map, kicked around some different ideas. And I actually think in the future, if we were to go and say, where else could we use an urban residential zoning district? We could actually think about national life. If national life did have an idea at some point in the future to say, you know, we'd you know, that's not a bad idea. We could go and do a similar type project up here. That same type of zoning district could be applied in another place. We're not proposing that here. We're not proposing that now. But the question was, could this zoning district actually be used somewhere else? And I think actually it could. And I did not very many places because we don't have a lot of big, flat, open parcels. But uh, that would be one I think potentially could that the district could fit. So the other quick changes... Um, there was a request for uh, waiver language for the signs. I did insert some language in 3012. Um, and I can go over these if people want. Uh, there was an additional minor edit to stormwater rules in 3009. That was after I had a discussion with Kurt Modicat. And so we did make a few um, small adjustments. Uh, we added back, I added back the solar device protection that you requested. So that part has been inserted back in. And, um, oh, and the last thing was just the planning commission review, which I had mentioned, um, that they approved your changes with a note that you should consider a legal opinion on the solar changes. So those were the only changes we had, and I will let you have any questions or public comment. And in terms of what we could do tonight, our options are either to adopt this tonight or to schedule a second uh, a fourth public hearing correct you could adopt it as uh the you know as presented in the march 13th edition you could amend this and if it's not a substantial change you could adopt it as amended or you could warn another public hearing and we would um consider another public hearing and is it your opinion that we these changes are not substantial enough to require another public hearing oh we've already that's why we're having the meeting today was because of substantial changes that were made on the 28th. Mm -hmm. um, you made changes, but they weren't in the text yet. So we put them in the text. We reviewed them with the planning commission and they are okay with those changes. Okay. All right. I'll 
open it up to uh, comments from members of the public. Um, let me just check and see what the sequence is. Uh, Peter Kelman, it looks like you're first. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, Mountain View Street in Montpelier. Just like to uh, re reiterate a couple of points, one I made at the first hearing, which is that I think we've seen uh, over the last six years since the overhaul of the 2018 uh, Unified Regulations that merely making zoning amendments while necessary is not sufficient to achieve the kind of housing results that are needed to address the housing crisis in our area. And I, I think that we really need to figure out some ways to do that besides simply uh, passing enabling um, uh, legislation or um, approvals. And one of the, now in, there are two general areas. One, I sent the members of the city council two notices recently. This is two out of dozens that I've seen over the last several years of other cities and towns doing very creative things to do housing with public-private partnerships, with developers, with individuals. I just don't see it happening here. Um, and, uh, you know, you, Mike talks about, well, you don't, I don't know, you know, you don't know what we're do doing. Well, I don't know what you're doing, but I can see nothing done, right? I have high hopes for uh, Country Club Road, but th that's going to take years. There are many other opportunities that have slipped by or that are still out there. And I think the city council should instruct Mike's department to be proactive in going after in, in going after some of these opportunities and encouraging people, individual uh, 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 property owners, to do their own subdivisions or uh, dividing up their homes, et cetera. S100 was passed and has a lot of opportunity in there for people to do things which were not possible before. I, I encourage Mike to explain this to the public, and I haven't seen any explanation to the public about how to, what you might do as an individual property owner to improve, increase housing. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Anthony. Oh, you're muted. Just a second. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hi, Anthony Irapino, a resident at 4 Sabin Street and also a downtown business owner. Um, want to thank um, the planning and zoning department and the volunteers and the planning commission for their hard work on the <clears throat> zoning update and want to uh, um, endorse partially what um, Mr. Kelman just said in terms of zoning being one piece of the puzzle, um, but there's certainly more that can be done by the city to um, encourage um, current property owners to unlock the develop housing development potential that we have in the city and to attract others here. Um, it was a, about a year ago that the Seven Days magazine ran a story in which one prominent developer was quoted uh, as um, noting that Montpelier has a reputation as a no development community. And that is a really sad statement about us in this moment right now when we have a housing crisis. And uh, it's not just about um, bringing new people here. It's also about the businesses and people that already live here. We have a demographic stagnation where we have an older population that's contributed so much to this community. And they're in houses that are probably bigger than they can afford to keep up. They they have no option to downsize. Um, we have less how, and as a consequence, we have less housing supply for younger families who are starting out. And as a consequence, we have also less opportunities for renters. And that's really critical for our downtown businesses in terms of workforce housing. In my law practice, I represented several um, restaurants and bars in the city who say it's really hard for them to make a go in Montpelier because they the people they employ can't afford to live in this community. So um, I agree with the, the spirit of the previous commenter, but I do want to say I also support the aspects of this zoning um, proposal that increase opportunities for 
density and infill housing. Um, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, we have some tough choices. We're at a crossroad in this community. A lot of people are chafing about tax increases, but at the same time, our schools have tremendous needs and our municipality has tremendous needs with crumbling roads, crumbling sidewalks, um, and water infrastructure that needs an overhaul. And, um, you know, we have executives in the city who are foregoing cost of living increases because our situation is so tight. So I, I for one, do support raising the amount of revenue we need to pay our bills, but I also think we need to do what we can to broaden the tax base. And you broaden the tax base by encouraging development and, in, and, and shaking off this reputation of Montpelier as a no development community. And I think the zoning amendments that have been proposed are a positive step in that direction. And I encourage you to adopt them. Thanks, Anthony. No, I'm Phyllis. Hi, um, I'm coming to this meeting unprepared. Phyllis, would you um, start by where, introducing yourself? Oh, Phyllis, Phyllis Rubenstein, uh, College Street, Montpelier, a resident, a homeowner. Um, I'm coming to the meeting unprepared. I cannot find in the 270 some page packet where the zoning regulations are and where the zoning map is. And I was not able, I don't know if this is new, the chat function did not work for me. So um, I couldn't ask the question by chat. So can well, somebody- I can, that up? I can tell you the chat function, we turned off the chat function because uh, this being a public meeting, we don't wanna facilitate, you know, side non-public uh, conversations as part of the meeting, but. Sure, I think it, at some point though, I was, I, you know, people were able to post something and then um, one of the staff persons responded with, you know, whatever the, the answer to whatever the minor question was. So where um, are the zoning regulations, the, the proposed regulations in the packet and where's the map? So, Mike, could you share your screen to show that? Uh, the current zoning, if you're looking for the current zoning, it is online. We'll have to just, it's not in the packet. It is two, 300 pages long. Oh, okay. But I thought that um, Bill said something about a map being attached or part of the, uh, the um, documents it, it's also posted online but i brought in hard copies for the counselors and for the public who is here but I there is, but the map is also posted online so if okay. you go to, if anyone is looking for it if you go to the the main page about halfway down there is a box on the right hand side that says zoning and subdivision regulations and if you click on that then it'll take you to where both the current and the proposed bylaws are Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Phyllis. Is there anyone else online who'd like to address the council on this topic? I don't see any electronic hands raised. And is there anyone in the room who would like to address uh, Mr. Weiss? Thank you. I'm Thomas Weiss, resident in District 2, and uh, I have a few comments about it. Um, I'm the one who introduced the term urban residential, I believe, and I'm having second thoughts as to whether that's actually the appropriate term for what this area has become. Maybe a village mixed use, but anyway. <laughs> um, the second question is last hearing you were questioning uh the retail was split at twenty thousand square feet for indoor retail and the apartment blocks that are in the plan i don't remember the exact title of the plan from last summer are about seven thousand square feet each and the building that's there now from the elks club is about fifteen thousand square feet just to give you some comparison scale as to how large a, I believe the less than 20,000 square feet is permitted. So that gives you some kind of a scale as to 
what's there now in relation to the apartment blocks that are proposed. So consider whether you might want to reduce the 20,000 square feet to something more commensurate with the apartment blocks that are there or, or are proposed. Um, the solar, uh, two comments on the solar. I appreciate it, well, three. I, first is I appreciate it being retained. Uh, second is a jargon issue. If they produce electricity, typically they're solar panels. If they produce hot water or hot air, they're typically solar collectors. So, and they're referred to as hot water panels in the in the proposed ordinance. So, I suggest that for your consideration. And I'm still really concerned with the protection only being 15 degrees either side of south. Uh, my solar panels are facing southeast, 45 degrees away, and they work just fine. At 45 degrees, you're only losing perhaps 10% of what you would be generating if you were due south. I realize you've already run the 15 degrees by the Planning Commission, and I, I haven't mentioned that before. So but those are my comments. So I think you've gotten to a point where you're really close to approving it. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who is present in the room who'd like to comment? And one last chance for people who are joining us online, if you'd like to comment. Oh, Brian Jones. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi, good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so my comments on the zoning are very brief. I just have a few comments and a few questions regarding the increase in density. Um, I think originally four units was proposed and then it jumped to six units. Um, I've had a few conversations with folks uh, and also with... Um, with Mr. Miller, Mike Miller via email about the increase. Um, I had a couple of notions as to maybe the difference, making a distinction between an increase of six units for uh, larger existing buildings that may benefit more from being broken up into smaller units. Uh, I think that was the original tent of, intent of this uh, of this change for increased density in neighborhoods that, <clears throat> excuse me, you all know this, but I'm just stating it for the for everyone else. Uh, neighborhoods that, excuse me, properties that are on public water and sewer. Um, I have no doubt that the increase in density will bring some positive um, uh, effects with it. Most notably, increased residency and um, an increased uh, revenue to to landlords. Um, specifically, uh, <clears throat> I think it's a multifaceted issue, housing, and um, I'm not sure that simply increasing density in all residential districts that are on public sewer and water will effectively address um, the housing crisis that is both in the state and also present in town. Um, and I, but I but I do think that it'll it'll be a good uh, step towards creating affordable ho housing. Uh, and affordable units, which are smaller. Um, so the recommendation that I have, or really it's just an idea, a notion, a question perhaps, is does it make sense, is it possible to apply this zoning increase only to existing buildings for the time being, um, and then potentially evaluate by working with other um, entities, um, other positive um, interventions um, that that may lead to more affordable housing of other types. Um, and uh, I think affordable housing is very important, and I think that it's also um, not categorically one thing. I think that folks with families being able to afford a house in town, in the state at large, um, is also an issue that, that the state is facing. And I think certainly... <clears throat> The demographics of uh, 
of, uh, of the town, a lot of folks in sing single folks in houses and also um, low numbers, maybe 8% of households being family households um, would indicate that there are other housing um, uh, populations to be addressed. And I'm just wondering if, um, if it's possible for the zoning to have a more specific approach be addressed uh, excuse me, um, assigned to existing buildings for the time being. Um, I think that it, as unlikely as some folks think it is, there may, we may have larger apartment buildings popping up in neighborhoods that would, would historically not have um, been able to allow this use, nor would they be at place. Um, <clears throat> and sorry, finally, um, the notion of affordable housing, perhaps there are incentives um, that that folks who are developing affordable housing uh, can um, kind of re, um, reconstruct, maybe that's not really the term I mean, but essentially create incentives for folks um, buying homes as well, rather than just folks um, who want to build an accessory dwelling unit or, um, or convert, you know, larger building to housing. Uh, I think that that single family home or duplex, what have you, um, for folks who might want to buy a home, have a rental, have the mother-in-law suite. I think that in the big picture, uh, that fits into affordable housing um, for the state and for Montpelier. Um, uh, and um, there may be folks working on this already, but um, um, I'm not sure that the increase to zoning will only come with uh, density, excuse me, will only come with positive results. And I'm okay. not sure that an umbrella um, policy to increase density will um, will Thank solve you. the issues that we that we're facing. So. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Your time has expired. And Mike, do you have a comment on that? I saw that comment and it, it seemed like it was a little different, like kind of the opposite of what we usually do with zoning, which is to <laughs> apply it to new construction and not it, not necessarily to current buildings, but what's your thought? That just for existing dwellings, it can be somewhat difficult to administer over time. Um, and there's a certain equity issue, I think, that goes along with it. Certainly in the short term, you remember what are the buildings that are new and what buildings are um, older. But certainly as time keeps going on, you have to remember which buildings are either pre-2024 or post-2024. And then there's the, the equity issue of, if you've built a building in 2025 that is meets all of the zoning regulations for a street, and all of the neighbors on the street are entitled to have six dwelling units, and you're only entitled to have two. And there's going to be a certain question that's going to come up of, well, why? Why Why would my, my building, just because I happen to be built, I happen to have rebuilt it on a foundation of a house that burned down, now I can only have two units. And there's a certain just equity issue that kind of comes in to say, am, am I really, we, we try to, in zoning, there's a philosophy of just trying to treat equal properties in an equal manner. And I think when you start going and distinguishing between one and another strictly on the basis of the older buildings are allowed to have more development, the new develop, new buildings are not allowed to have the same development, even though they have to meet the same rules. So you don't think it's either practical or a good idea to uh, make this change? Yeah, I would think um, I, I would think in the fairest thing to do would be to to have it apply equally across all the properties. Um, certainly, if there are concerns about um, bulk and massing, and that was my comments that I, I made to Brian was uh, regarding if there are differences where new buildings can be built bigger and look different than the existing neighborhood, then it's not an issue of density. It's an issue of bulk and massing. Uh, how high can you make your building? How big can the footprint be? How much lot coverage can you have? Well, if the zoning rules are correct, what we have is something that either matches what's on the ground or matches what we would like to see in the future. And so if you're building something that matches that, you should have the same rights that the existing building would have, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, we're still in the public hearing. I'm just... Uh... Checking again to see if there's anyone who's joined us or uh, 
is present in the room who would like to be heard on uh, on the proposed zoning amendments before we close the public hearing. Um, Brian, you've already been heard from. I would take another one to two sentences, um, but no more than that. But I want to see if there's anyone else. Okay, Brian, do you have an idea that can be expressed in one to two sentences? Why don't you unmute yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. I was just saying thank you for hearing uh, my public comments. Okay, thanks. Um, so in response to the notion of old versus existing, I realize that it does create a bit of an issue, and I think that that's worth something worth examining uh, in the bigger picture. It might be possible to address this by imposing a kind of duration of you know how these zoning how the zoning code affects a building which is old and large and existing. Um, I think that, and Mike and I spoke a little bit about that via email. Um, I do kind of feel uh, inherently that density is the third leg of, of the zoning chair that kind of keeps it standing up. You've got bulk massing and then density. Um, this will make it possible for six unit apartment buildings to be built. Uh, Okay, I think I'm going to cut you there. I think we're just mostly going over what we've heard, and so I'd like to move on. Thank you. Anything else? All right. I will, at this point, close the public hearing and we get back to the council and ask the council what you'd like to do at this point. So, well, um, I got some input from uh, some of the energy committee folks on the solar um, reworking, and um, it keeps getting more. <laughs> it keeps getting more and more problematic. Um, as it's currently written, I think it would it would prevent partly because of the the uh, lot line calculation. You know where you you need to take the height of the building, subtract twenty five feet, divide it by ten, and come up with point two five. That doesn't work in a lot of infill situations, right? I mean, it it just it's just impossible. Can it be? Uh, so and so and of course we have the planning commission's recommendation for a legal review, which is probably worth doing. Um, I think it's also worth pursuing, though, because protecting, particularly rooftop rooftop solar, which would be the easiest thing to to protect, uh, is is important. I think I think it's valuable to the homeowners. Um, it would be it would be easier for new construction for planned development, and I wonder if we can can we do, can we divide it between. Plan development and infill, or and again, you're you're talking about the same the same rules applying to everybody. But in this case, it's um, it's very difficult, I think, to make it work for everybody. All right. So I guess the the first comment um, I struck figure three dash twenty three, which is the shading diagram, and the reason why I struck that is it's a formula that's specifically calculated to judge December twenty first. So, but the calculation is still in in the language, isn't it? Uh, in the text itself, or is it? Oh, the, it you're you're it, correct. It sneaked, uh, it sneaked back in there. It is still the applicants may demonstrate the conformance by meeting that. Technically, if they did meet that requirement, they would be meeting the solar shading requirement for the twenty first as well. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it says they may demonstrate. So while we could strike it, and it wouldn't be a substantial change because technically it's. It's not there. We could strike it at this time if we wanted to, the, mm. the formula. But that was why I removed the, the diagram was because um, I think um, Councillor Hurl had pointed out that these are relatively easy calculations to make based on um, the, 
the solar folks that are around. There's enough folks around that can do these calculations. It yeah. wouldn't be a burden for a new project to demonstrate the, the shading impact. We don't get very many projects that need to go through this requirement. The few that do could have that calculation done. Um, so what do you think, and Sal, should that be an amendment? Well, uh, yeah, def I think that should definitely be an amendment. I'm just wondering if, uh, I, I think it needs testing somehow. I, I have no idea whether whether it would work. I sort of threw out the 10 a.m., 2 a.m. last time as an example of how, where we could go. I have no, idea, <laughs> have no idea whether it works, whether it makes sense, whether it's a reasonable measurement. Looking at um, some of the ordinances that um, other other cities have have implemented or thought about a lot of it has to do with actually establishing um you know covenants rights to rights to the um rights to the sun, to the sunlight in adjoining properties and so on i mean it gets it gets complicated complicated um but i think it's complicated for a reason because i think uh, the, this sort of simple method um doesn't work in a lot of situations. Uh, it'd be great if it if it did, but it 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 seems difficult. Um, certainly, eliminating the protection altogether helps infill. It doesn't it doesn't help plan development, and you know we're we're poised to need it there, you know, in a significant significant way in the near future. So uh, I'm not sure what I'm recommending. I just I, I it it doesn't seem to work. The old you know, the, the even the revised language doesn't quite work, and eliminating it altogether that doesn't quite work. Um, you know, I, I suppose better better to have something than nothing, and and review it. If, you know, if the issue comes up, it doesn't come up that often now with infill. It it may come up. I mean, it's something I think we ought to carefully look at it, any sort of plan development, um, and maybe uh, test it before that happens so that we have some idea of, you know, how to how to measure it. Is that, I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, general, I guess another in general... Another practical problem. Yeah. yeah, in general, I would say where we're at is better than where we are today in the zoning. And so it's a step in the right direction. It can always move if for some reason we find this is not doing a good enough job protecting solar in the future, we can always come back. I mean, we come back um, come back about once a year for zoning updates. They're long processes, but we track how permits are going. We look at how you know uh, certain requirements are written. Could we write them better? And we keep track of them, and we note things down so we can make these improvements. And there's another one that could come back. I think this is a step in the right direction. What we have is really unusable. What we have proposed here, I think, is a step in the right direction. And if it's not protecting enough, and the council wants to move it to a higher standard, and we could certainly go back and look at that in the future. And if it's still still impacting development too much, we can move it further. But I think this is a step mm -hmm. and it's a good good positive step in 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 the right direction. Well I, I agree that's it's better than uh, removing it altogether. Um I would want to put it on a list though for review over the next year so that we we definitely uh, had had something to review, you know, some sort of test or input from some other jurisdiction that's maybe solved it or come closer than we have. Because we're balancing two things that we want, right? Sell solar energy and more, more development. Yeah. And, and we want a, and if we want a fair, efficient process. So if we've got an easy test, we should identify the easy test that's like you, you need to run, you know, whatever, an SR50 test or whatever it is. Then people know, okay, you got to run that test, contact your local technician that runs it and we run it, whatever that. So that way we've kind of got a nice, efficient way for builders to know I've run the test, it come back positive, or I ran the test, it came back negative, I'm going to adjust my project in this way so that way I can get, because developers don't want to have issues in, in the hearings. They want to have very quick processes. They want to be able to go and check that box and say, I yep. meet the requirements. Mm -hmm. Tim. Listening and processing, so there is no test at the moment, right? 
uh, the test that is written that we wrote in um, was, and this was an adjustment to what was in there, um, proposed development shall not shade existing. And what was changed is to, or proposed solar devices, solar voltaic panels, panels and hot water panels oriented within 15 degrees of true south on abutting parcels to a greater extent than the hypothetical 25 foot high wall. And I think this is what um, Sal was referring to. We could remove the 25 foot wall constructed on the property line um, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. during the primary solar season, parentheses, March equinox to September equinox, close parentheses. Um, and so that way there is there is a formula that solar providers, they can run these types of tests. So you can look at how, how high the building's gonna be and what is the impact it's going to have. And really what we would do as staff is, or developers would is to, to look to the north because sun's in your south, you're casting a shade, a shadow to the north to see if there's anything within that 15 degrees that would um, be a solar panel or a solar device. And if you don't have anything over there, you don't have to do the analysis because there's nothing to measure it against. But if there are solar panels in that window, then we need to run the analysis to see whether or not the new proposal would impact them. So did you just mention something that you think we should amend in the language that we have right now? Um, yes, uh, Sal pointed out, because what this was, uh, on an abutting parcel, on abutting parcels, I think we would have to strike. Making sure I get it right. Writing an ordinance on the fly like this can't be good. <laughs> uh, well, in this case, it's, it's just really the thing. I, we could actually could leave the language in because it's, it, as we said, that that is. If you meet that requirement, um, but if you take out to a greater extent than a hypothetical 25 foot wall constructed on the property line, then it would instead, if you just took that section out, which was the December 20th, it would be oriented 15 degrees of, tor of true north on abutting properties between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on the primary solar season. So it would just require striking that piece of the middle of the sentence there. So you're raising a question, Tim. Should, are we ready to vote this, or should we take schedule this for another hearing? My gut feeling, it's not. It just seems like legal challenges in the making. It sounds like we're not ready. I see nods from around the table. Everyone agree with that? Okay. Why don't we take a motion to? But are you talking about simply the solar provision or the whole thing? Because you have other sections that are not related to the solar. You could approve those sections and if you chose and go forward with, and then look at the solar as an independent issue. Mm -hmm. you could, you Which I think is a sensible thing because that way we can yeah. be moving forward on the other stuff. Yeah. Is somebody prepared to make a motion? Harry. So I'll move that we approve uh, all of the proposed zoning changes aside from the solar regulation. Does that work? Is there a second? No, I thought that was what you just said you want, agreed you wanted to I do. But... Say I would approve everything else. But that was what, her, what she said, all the, the whole thing except for the solar. Right. And I'm saying in the whole thing, there's other things I have issues with. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> gotcha. Adrian. Is the question? Sure. I'm oh. still waiting for a second for oh. Carrie's motion, but but yeah, go ahead and ask we'll your question. Wait until we finish that. No, that's okay. Um, it'll be changing the subject a little bit. Oh, well then that's okay. I'm not hearing a second to Carrie's motion. So it fails for lack of a second. Does somebody else want to take a stab at making a motion? Mike. 
Um, can I just go and I wanted to respond and uh, get to respond to um, Mr. Weiss's comment on the 20,000 square foot retail. That was. One Recording is, again, the progress. building height minus 25 feet formula, which we've just said doesn't matter. So we should just strike that second. The applications may demonstrate conformance by either one or two. So that takes that removes all pieces of that 20 foot, 25 foot high wall formula that was in there. And, and I'd like to be clear, too. When I suggested that we could approve the other side, I didn't necessarily mean right that second. I just meant we don't if people get comfortable where we end up on the density and the, the urban residential and those kind of things. We don't necessarily need to move those to another public hearing if the solar is the only thing that's out. If we still, if we want to, you can. It's, but um, I just meant at the end of this conversation, you can approve some and keep, keep it yeah. under. So if there are uh, amendments that you want to move, um, yeah, maybe a little but, bit up front for what they're about for me. Yeah, and let, let, let I just put uh, Adrian on right on hold. So let's uh, hear from you first. So um, as I had a, a crash course in zoning, this might be outside the purview of this policy, but I did want to ask and learn a little bit more, maybe offline. But I did want to make a comment about. Um, you know, we have this 234 page zoning, which is very important. Um, we talked about this today. It's really critical to um, think about our future of Montpelier and creating high density um, opportunities for both our current homeowners and new development. And talking to some of my neighbors and thinking about how does this apply to them? There's, you know, a, a, a big disconnect in terms of the complexity of zoning. And so thinking about or for me to learn about what are the current efforts to take this complex document and market it, promote it to our neighbors that may want to um, subdivide their homes or for new developers to be attracted to our city um, because this is such an amazing opportunity for Montpelier. I didn't know if there was a part of this document. I didn't see a chapter in here that kind of took it to the next level of being proactive and marketing and, and sharing this information to entice this type of development within our community. And so I just was wondering what um, that looked like. I, I can answer that quickly. This is the ordinance, ordinance and regulation itself. So this document would be the regulation, how we choose to then promote it, market it. We would do that through communication. Once it's changed, then we can say, these are your new opportunity. So that is clearly something that we would be wanting to do, but it wouldn't be part of the actual regulation, much like some of the other comments we had earlier, but this isn't enough to to solve the housing problem. I think we all agree, but this is this, this is the zoning part of it. We still need to talk about the other aspects of it at different times, um, what, what we're doing with the other things. So this is, we're focused right now on the ordinance itself. The ordinance itself. I copied the darn thing today because it's hard to read online. It's just unnavigable. It's not, it doesn't work. And I think that's a national problem. It's not just here. The way zoning codes have built over the years, all over the country. The more I read about it, communities are grappling with the same problem everywhere in this country. And this is just a glom. Things should keep being added to it. We're doing it again tonight. Uh, what happens in these situations is because really nothing can get through or very little uh, through the filter and that you'll find that things like our own country club road property doesn't even fit the zoning for the uses we want for it. So we're effectively generating a giant variance here by creating this new urban residential zone um, just for this property effectively. And I think we've got to look harder at this. You know, I think in your in the recent election, you commented that there hasn't been new housing and private sector hasn't produced it in 
it, you've given them a chance and now it's time, Jack, to look at public options. And that hit me pretty hard because I came to realize that the reason, the big reason we don't have housing here from private sector is we've zoned it out. Effectively, you have when you look at this. And even the Country Club Road project, we couldn't do if we didn't change the zoning to accommodate our own wishes. So what I love to see us do is urban residential is a neat thing. I really want to see housing there. Um, but I think it's a new zoning category and it's it's a it's a new idea, largely put together by staff. I think it needs more time and energy and community engagement to, to look at it and look at other properties. There's got to be more than just um, Country Club Road and Stever Blaney Slice and National Life that we can have for places we want to see housing where this type of zoning would be appropriate. Um, so I, my take for uh, maybe a, a suggestion tonight would be to approve all the changes um, in the zoning ordinance um, that are largely to increase density, um, to increase the pagination and page numbers and all those pieces as well. And the only pieces I would remove would be the, um, the urban zoning pieces um, so that they can have additional conversations so we can look at other properties that can benefit from this as well as the country club road property. Um, and the, uh, the shading ordinance I think should also be held out um, for future work. So that's my suggestion. So Tim, I'm trying to uh, figure out what, uh, how I should think about what you're saying, because at our last meeting, we, we discussed the very thing that you're talking about, applying uh, the urban residential definition to other areas of the city. And, you know, we talked about Steve Riblini's property. We talked about potentially Saban's pasture. Mm -hmm. um, and and I thought we came to a point, you know, I hadn't, we hadn't talk, talked about national life, although it seems like a sensible idea, but it, I think we came to the, to a point where most of the council was agreeing that we could adopt this the way it is and uh, continue to look for other locations to apply the principles of uh, urban residential uh, in other parts of the city. I don't, I, my, my impression of the sense of the rest of the council was that the majority was not in favor of holding up this whole package and, or even the residential uh, urban residential part of the package while we did that last bit, which, uh, which I agree is a good idea to, to find other places where we could do it. So do you think I'm not under correctly understanding what we did last time? I guess your interpretation of mine very little, but I mean, in, you know, we both, I think, have the same end goal. I think it's, it's like, how do you get there? And, mm -hmm. you know, part of it is, I think we still haven't done the basic homework that we were talking about about a year ago for the Country Club Road property. I mean, I think we have plenty we can be doing there and moving that forward and still have good conversation about this and refine it and not just kind of push it through. It feels like there's some pressure to push it through to get a process going for development. But I still firmly believe we've skipped some of the first steps and we've got to get back to the basics on this one. Um, we just, we're doing it backwards and you've got to do the engineering up front. You've got to do the site assessment work. I know some's been done, but not enough to, to find the project. And then you have more public input and, and a design. Uh, we're not there. Um, Pellin. So if you leave the country club road portion out and to discuss more and decide later, would we affect this um, uh, approval? In How will it affect? The whole process. Let me ask about that. You can't move the um, growth center designation forward unless the zoning changes, and we can't do the TIF application until the growth center application. So I think the proposal was, if assuming we pass the zoning around now, 
um, that we would then seek to amend the growth center, which takes two or three months, and then seek the zoning. And while that was happening, do the engineering, other work that needed to be done so that by the time we had all the legal underpinnings to move it forward, we'd also have everything else in. And I think that's what the council said, and then seek a development partner once we had the whole package put together. Um, so we, we can't, so that that's really, that's the difference. If we, if we don't do the zoning change, then we delay them. It just takes longer for us to do the growth center change. Carrie. Yeah, so I, I take the point about doing the engineering and all of the due diligence on that property very seriously. And I, so I want us to do that, but I, I don't know that failing to change the zoning would speed that process up. So if we change the zoning, we're not obligating ourselves to do anything. We're simply opening doors to allow something that could happen. If we don't change the zoning, then it keeps the door closed. We can't change the growth center. We can't get the TIF. So I would, I'd like to change the zoning. I would like to continue that conversation about where else might have this urban residential zoning, because I do think it's a very interesting idea, but I don't want to hold up the current properties that we've identified for this zoning change. So I'd like to make the zoning change now. I would like to continue that conversation about where else this could apply. And I, and if we don't do whatever other due diligence we need on the country club road property, then I, I don't want to move ahead with that. So that's, but that feels like a separate issue to me than the zoning change. So. Um, I, until, until, um, I was on this council. I didn't think much about it sounding, frankly. Um, but I, I think of it as doing three things, talking about the use, or in this case, we're really, we're changing the use to, to uh, accommodate housing and, and we're changing density, which I uh, put in that category. It describes the physical attributes, the architectural elements of the structures, and it, it defines a process, I think. Um, I'm okay on the use side. I the description of the architectural on the architectural side of things is is very much like what the buildings we have downtown. Is that that what we want? What we want at Country Club Road? And it, is that con, that seems constraining to? I'm thinking the Country Club Road property is a pretty spectacular piece of land, particularly if you stand with your back to it and look south and west. The way the zoning's written, uh, you know, it, it talks about blank, blank walls and, um, you know, base, middle, and cap, and a lot of stuff that that describes a downtown building. But I don't know that it makes any sense. On um, it certainly doesn't make any sense to restrict people to to that kind of thing. So how how restrictive is it exactly? There's a lot of stuff in here about. Um, you know, blank walls and number of windows and windowsills aligning with adjacent buildings. I mean, there are no adjacent buildings. What's going on there? So a lot of the architectural standards are trying to, you can look around occasionally, don't want to go and pick on certain buildings that are out there, but certain buildings have been built that you can look at and go into is just something doesn't look right about it. And so usually it doesn't have, you know, maybe the building doesn't have a cap on it, you know, throw one out there, city center is one that architects can kind of look at and say, oh, it's missing right, this, it's stuff. it's missing this, it's missing that. And having those elements provides a certain amount of character. And you don't want these long walls of nothing. So by having a requirement in there that says, look, you, you, we're going to make sure you, you have to have changes. Even if it's a single building, it's got to change. It's got to have a step out here and there. And you'll find a lot of even... Um, buildings, if you were to go down to, to Essex and South Burlington and these strictly residential buildings, you'll see they're no longer these big flat walled buildings. They they step out, they have balconies, they have different features because that visual, those visual changes are important to making things look attractive and dynamic. And so it's trying to capture just, the, the architectural standards are really basic and just trying to capture some of the base things. The best thing to have is to have design review standards 
that are much more like we have for the art design review district. But this is kind of a, a you know, for areas that aren't in the design review district, this gives you that opportunity to at least go and start to take away some of those those problem things. If you're going to build multi-story buildings, and that's what we've talked about here, we want multi-story buildings, then you should have those definitions of those different architectural features. Um, but again, uh, I think some of these we will we will see over time what what gets proposed, and you know until they get tested, you you don't know one hundred percent how everything's going to work, but. Um, yeah, no, thank you. That makes sense. And I, I love the caps on tops of buildings. I think it makes a huge difference. So I understand what you're, what you're saying. I was just wondering how constraining it is in an, in a completely new development. Um, one other thing I wondered about is this, um, the, lo the lowest area of the property, the, the flat area where you first enter country, country club road, uh, is where we're allowing the tallest buildings. Does that make sense? Don't that's, they don't they block everybody behind them? That's where the the public hearing process came out. That process that we had last year, mm -hmm. um, we we talked about various different options um, and various different heights. You know how how big of a building would you think would be appropriate? And they had straw polls and they had opinions, and that's what came out. And, you know, I was surprised to see that people were willing to see five-story buildings in there, but you're going to build those on flat areas. You're not going to build those higher up on the up up on the hill on the on the uneven parts. You're going to put those generally in the lower parts um, for for those those types of buildings. And we talked about should they be on the left and have the park land on the right, or should they be on the right and the park land on the left? And the well, decision I mean, we, was the park land would be on the yeah. the east and the developed residential units would be on the west. Well, I was just thinking, you know, we, we talked about the solar shading thing. Now we have a six-story six story building that's across the street from, from what? Another six-story building, okay. But if it's a, you know, two-story townhome, not so much. Um, does it does it make sense? I mean, I, the public may have said, "Sure, we can, you know, we can put a five story building there." Um, it doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense? It, it, to may, you? it may end up being <laughs> eventually end up being exempt. Right now, um, the urban um, shading rules don't apply in urban center one, two, and three, basically for that reason. The buildings. Well, I'm not talking good. about shading. Just yeah. I'm just talking about view. I'm talking about looking at the yeah. back of a six story building instead of the sunset on the other side of the valley. Um, well, and it's, it might be worth pointing out that throughout the meetings we had with the, with our consultants, they constantly were saying, what you're seeing here is not a picture of what we're proposing should be built here. What this is, this is sort of an idea of what might go here once, uh, you know, just to put some flesh on the bones, but we're looking at uh, the number of units, how those units might be distributed. We're not Though all those pictures were not a picture of what they're saying is going to happen. I just point out too that you know these are the the trade offs. So that, that you know if the more density, the more housing we want, that, then they probably will be bigger. You know, I think these days it's more cost effective to build multi unit buildings and to build. You know, if we want three or four hundred units, they're not going to build three or four hundred single family homes there. It's going to be multi family stores of five or six stories. So there will be some compromises probably to view and other things. I mean, it's, I, I, you know, we don't know. And I think that's what our development, once we have a developer, they're going to say, this is what we think is the mix and what this is what we think we can sell and or rent. And this is where it would go, but this gives them the biggest opportunity to have the most choices. And, you know, if you think about the property, if you have the higher buildings down below, the next part is up higher. So it's entirely possible that those, I could actually be even still be looking over them. I'm not, I'm not yeah. a mass expert, so I don't, don't take that for anything other than just my opinion. But, um, you know, I, you, those are the those are the questions that we will be continuing to ask throughout this whole process until we build whatever's there, and it won't be us building it. So. And and we own the land, so at this point, anyone who comes in with a proposal to build something that we just think is awful. <laughs> We can say no. We're not. 
selling you the land to sell you a parcel to build this awful thing. So I mentioned three three elements. The third one being the process. What what does this revision do to make the process easier? A lot of the complaints that I've heard, uh, not not just at at meetings, but you know, on the street, is that the process is the process is difficult. It's complicated, and it um, doesn't encourage developers. Does does this revision alter that in a significant way, or does it? Does it make it worse or does nothing change on the process side? Uh, uh, so, I mean, certainly making the, the rules, removing density, it's going to remove a set of requirements. Um, so usually, you know, a lot of people, I think, have different opinions of the regulations, many times based on old stories. Um, you know, I got a design review approval in 2006, and then I got denied for the same thing in 2012. Well, the, the rules, we don't have those rules anymore. Well, I had a friend that had this happen to him, and I had a friend that had that happen to them. For the most part, the zoning we've had since 2018 is completely different. And yes, these are very big, heavy, thick documents, but they are designed to be more administrative. So the big answer I try to give everyone is if you have an idea, the, the best thing to do is to call the planning staff and they'll walk you through it because most of these rules don't apply to you. But under the old rules, you could write very simple things and leave them open to interpretation and have them go to a board. So most decisions, most projects had to go to a board um, we had rules before 2018, if you lived on Town Hill Road, that your front setbacks and your back setbacks were so big that they actually physically overlapped on many parcels, <laughs> making every single property non-conforming. So every single property had to go to DRB for a non-conforming use determination. So everybody would comment on everything for every swimming pool, fence, doghouse. It, I don't understand how people live that way, but... Most of our rules now, as I said, the the time since I've been here, we've we go literally ten times faster. That's not an exaggeration. That's literal truth. We are ten times faster about issuing permits. The decisions, but in order to issue decisions administratively, we need to have clear rules. Zoning administrators do not have the right to have to to administer subjective rules. So you need to have a lot of rules about. How do you, you know, you can't just say have a height of 30 feet. What happens if the front of the house is here and the back of the house is here? How do you calculate the height? Well, now I got to have rules. So how, how do we measure height? And everything, as you start getting into the details, has to have that detail answered, which is what makes things get big. Um, you know, how do we do landscape plans? We every, It used to be every site plan would go to the to the DRB. Now we have administrative site plans. So we have very clear, detailed rules of what you have to have for landscaping. That way, Meredith can answer that and make that decision administratively rather than having a board hearing and notifying all the abutters. Mm -hmm. So it is it is longer. It is clearer for, for people who know what they're doing. They can look at these rules, go through and say, OK, what are my requirements for landscaping? They can look them up and they're, they're written right there. And you can and you can work them out. If you don't know, that's perfectly fine. Um, everybody's tax dollars pay for Audra and Meredith to help you through the process. You don't have to pay Audra to ask questions. You only have to pay if you actually are doing a project and doing a thing. You can go in and call and ask questions at any time. It doesn't cost you any money. And our job is to help everybody through the process. And as I said, most permits, 90% um, of all permits, are going to go through administratively, which means the only person you're dealing with is going to be either Audra or Meredith, and they're going to go through the process, and they're going to issue the permit, and there isn't going to be a hearing. There might be a DRC hearing if you're in the design review district, but now those are administrative as well. You go to the DRC, goes back to Meredith, and she issues the permit. So it's, it's a much clearer set of rules. Um, again, we wrote new design review rules because... The rules in the past were five sentences, and those were the design review rules, and the board would decide what each one of those sentences meant. 
So if you applied in 2005, you might be denied. And in 2008, you might be approved for the identical project. And it shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. Rules should be administered consistently over time. So the new design review rules are much longer, but they're also um, allowing for less issues uh, as they come along. But again, the, the biggest thing we try to tell people is um, contact Meredith and contact Audra, and they will answer your questions. They'll help you through. They'll tell you what permits you need, and they'll tell you if you don't need a permit. We have a lot of exemptions in here that say you don't need a permit for a number of things. If you've got a question, I want to repave my driveway. Do I need a permit for that? No, you don't. Um, and we can answer those questions. I want to need new shingles on my roof. Do I need a permit? Well, no, you don't. Um, you might need a building permit, but not a zoning permit. So that's that's usually the advice I try to give people um, when it comes to uh, certainly the thickness and the, the heft of it and the process of getting permits. At this point, is as easy as we could make it. There's a state law that says certain things we have to do, and we've got a process that is about as streamlined as we can get at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm not sure I want to hold up the, the process, uh, provided that we, that what the sort of process you described, Bill, of simultaneously laying the groundwork while we go back and do the the sort of dirty work to figure out what's what up there, uh, how deep the soil lines can go before we have to blast or something. Who knows. Um, it just um, it's it's it just delays. I think the, the the opportunity we have to move forward. So to get sort of a straw poll on things, does everybody agree that we should take more time with the solar part of it? Okay, good. Um, what would that mean? Can I ask? Um, um, does that mean we're going back to leaving everything the way it is today and have and, and coming back requiring and... it so shading would still apply to roofs, walls, and yards? <laughs> that, that's what I'm trying to make sure as I understand is when we say we're not doing the shading, does it mean we're going back to the way things are today? Does it mean remove the entire thing and we'll come back with a or does it mean what? Or does it mean? Be be ready. Can we be ready to vote the solar shading rules out in two weeks? Probably. That's that's really the question, right? Probably not. My sense is that they're more complicated than that. Okay. If if we want them to work and if we want them to stick in a legal challenge, I think we we have to go through a process. <laughs> so I'm with you, Mike. I'm not sure what what people are saying, what's being said here. Leave the whole thing the way it is now until someone has taken more time with it. Uh, it hasn't come up, has it? Uh, currently, I mean, has there been a project's been turned down? Due to the so walls, the existing solar roof shading, wall, the, the roof walls and yards the crazy rule. Crazy math with the yeah. 20 it, it, we we haven't. We had a close one, but we it it worked out because basically because the property, the new property that was getting built, was on the south side of the street, so the shading had to cross the street and the oh, front yard yeah. before you it was. Reached. That to us last week. Yeah, but had it been on a on a different orientation on a street, it would have impacted its neighbor. I, I'd be inclined to, to leave it to protect to protect um, properties and and existing solar installations. I mean, right now, there's not there. If we take it out and someone wants to block. I mean, it's, it's hard to do, but you you can do it. You can block a rooftop solar installation. We have nothing that prevents that. Not even doesn't even require review without without something. And so, who would need to be consulted to get to the point where 
we can be be satisfied with it because Mike's department has looked at it. Planning Commission has looked at it. Who else would be part of that conversation before we're before people feel we're ready to go ahead? Me is someone well, on MEAC who would want to planning recommended uh, a legal review of this of this ruling, but I think what we need is a legal review of existing solar solar zoning and and pick pick what we think applies best to our situation and propose that. With the very least, we should test what we're proposing because, I mean, right, right now I, I can see, you know, it says, right now it says between what, March 21, it says for the whole season. So people are gonna wonder, do I have to measure every day? And I think the answer is yes. You have to measure every day because a tall structure in the middle will block at a certain angle that won't block in the morning or in the evening, but it might block, you know. So and, yeah, I think they would probably have to probably analyze two days: the 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 September and the March. And because the, if you don't impact on September and March, it's not going to impact. It's not going to suddenly become an issue as the sun gets higher and not higher. Not at ten o'clock in the morning. The, yeah, the shading gets shorter and shorter. So the most likely days for it to impact would be. Either at because the, the, the building end. is over here, because the building's over here, we'd have to measure. We have to do a, a, a study of the March and the September and see if either day has interference. And we might want to check the time. Uh, the 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 current the, the original was nine o'clock on December twenty first, and nine we might test nine versus ten and three versus two, just as a if we're going to test. And we have a comment from Mr. Weiss who. I hope you're going to be slashing through the Gordian knot. <laughs> well, not quite, but you only have to do it on the equinox, either the 21st of March or the 21st of September, because the they're equal. The way that the way the sun goes, they're they're basically equal. Oh, so, yeah. um, if it meets the criterion on either one of the equinox equinoxes, then it'll meet it at any other time in the period between the two going through the summer solstice. Good point, because hence the name equinox, that's <laughs> equal. That's where it comes from. Equal, uh, yeah, night and days are equal yep. in terms of power. Okay. Do you have it? Uh, does that help, Mike? Um, yeah, I mean, it just, it does clarify. We just need that one that study on that one day. Mm -hmm. And really, as we said, even at that one time, it really doesn't matter. You're not really having to look at noon because the, the yeah. shades get shading gets shorter. So it really yep. is. Although you would in that case probably need the beginning and the end because the sun moves. It may shade more on the 10 o'clock. It may shade to the left on the 10 o'clock and the right on the basis. Thomas Weiss again. Um, I would say that one would need to do it for the entire period of hours because if yeah. the building is due south, that's obstructing. It's, it's one set of conditions. But if the building is offset one side or the other from the new building is offset one side or the other, you'd have to do it during the whole period. And, so you're and, saying sunrise to sunset on either equinox? You've got it set between the hours of 10 and 2. Right. So if you leave it at 10 and 2, you'd only have to look at the the solar curve. I don't know if any of you have seen a solar curve before. The, the, the time of day and the angle and the sun does this. Uh, during the day, I mean, you, you you've all watched it from sunrise to sunset and how the sun changes during the day. Uh, so if you choose nine to three, then you'd have to look at how the shadows occur from the new building during that entire period to see whether they affect uh, the building. Because if if the new building is is over here, then it might affect it. At, 1.30 in the afternoon, but it wouldn't affect it any other time. So you'd have to check all of them. Yeah, no, I think that's the... And, and the solar people, yeah. as somebody said, you know, they've got all the 
little gizmos and computer programs that can can work that out pretty quickly. Whether they do it for free or not, that's a different question. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Well, if you're the developer and you're investing money on putting up a new building, that's just another cost. So, um, <clears throat> do we think we can have that ready by two weeks from now? I know that there, there's the question of of getting a legal review, and I assume the question, Mike, was whether the city has legal authority to regulate this at all. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, that was their concerns. Um, you know, Bill and I talked about it, and you know, we have these existing rules. Our thought was, you know, we're trying to be judicious judicious about how we're spending our money that we have. Um, we're making the rules less restrictive. So we've had these rules since 2018. Um, so if we're making them that much less restrictive, that we're probably okay for now. And we could review that at a later time rather than holding up the readoption. Because if, especially if we're going to go back and have another uh, set of reviews on these at you know at a future time. I mean, we could option we could adopt these rules as proposed in the March thirteenth, and have a set of things that we're going to look at for the next set of amendments. So that way, we've made we're not removing it all together. We're not keeping what we know is a problem or somewhere in the middle, um, and we'll continue to study the issue and come up with new recommendations. We could work with MIAC, and maybe MIAC can also help to try to come up with some better language that helps, you know, their meet their objectives. Um, you know, what is what is the best, what is the most appropriate path for us to protect existing solar devices? Yeah, I, I think you can do this with a SketchUp model, and I know a guy who knows a guy who might be able to do something. So. <laughs> okay, so what's your proposal now? It what he said. How's that? To to adopt it the way it is now with the plan to come with forward. The, you're gonna take the math out though, right? The, you're taking out the 25 foot wall or yeah, the, yeah. the 25 foot wall is out. There were those two that piece of one sentence I would suggest taking out, and that three sentences again, those are just all references to that. Yeah, you took you took out the illustration, but the language was still a thing. Yeah, so, I, yeah. yeah. So those okay. three sentences I would suggest taking out, which I would not personally consider a substantial change because they're reflective of the old rules that we had changed. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is change the the use table to from 20,000 to 10,000 per retail. That would, those would be the two suggestions that I would. And having heard that is someone who wants, is there someone who wants to move this the way it is with those uh, couple of amendments? I will move it the way it is with those amendments. Is there a second? And there's a second. Uh, oh. no, I'm sorry. I, um, without being able to see it in writing and just kind of hearing these notes, I have to say this is challenging for me to be able to vote on it. So... So I'm not seconding it because okay. of that. Bring it back to this meeting. We have to vote now. Yeah. No, we don't have to vote now. Um, I think that's where we are then. All right. So we would just need a motion to continue the hearing to what date? So long. On everything. Yeah. I think and that's... I don't know if we could, and I was going to comment on that. I don't know if we can adopt in part. I don't know if that's an, an option. I don't know that we can't. But I've never had any community adopt in part and leave part of it. But in theory, they could say we adopt this chapter, this chapter, and we don't adopt this chapter, right? They yeah, but that. then we would have to then then it's done. Everything that was not adopted has been by then default let's play it safe. denied. <laughs> so does that mean we're scheduling another public hearing in two weeks? And can we? Or, or it's probably already scheduled, right? 
It's not already no. scheduled. It, this we would be continuing the hearing to April third. I I don't know when the next meeting is. It's it's March twenty seventh and March then April third. Okay, so it's up to you guys whether it's March twenty seventh or April third. No, April third is your night, right? April third is going to be a very busy night already. But yeah. yes, I wouldn't want to go and do a zoning hearing in front of Kurt again, though. No, it hurts on April twenty on the March. 27th. Well, on the March twenty seventh. That's what I was saying. If you go to March twenty seventh, then you're at my at Kurt's meeting. Why don't we do April third then? Does that work? Mm -hmm. Is that is it, were you saying you would prefer not to be on the same night I, as Kurt? It's, it's up to you. I was kind yeah. of joking because last time Kurt got to sit behind me while we had a very very long meeting on the fourteenth. So. And Kurt and Kurt really had a lot to do that night too. So yeah. All right. Why so don't we? I, I will strike those three lines, and we will. And the change in. And the change on the use table. Mm -hmm. And. Need a motion for continuing. Yeah. I'm. We continue to March twenty seventh, April third. April third. April third. There, and there's a second. Uh, and I know that we all like to save uh, paper, but I'm going to request to give everyone. On the council hard copy. Okay. All those in okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you. Um so Josh, we are up to you. And I'm we're at the time where we uh would ordinarily take a break. So I'm going to say we take our 10 minute break now. Well, I, was, well, I was going to say, why don't we deal with the folks for their housing issue and then take a break before my presentation. That's fine. They've been waiting for a long it, time. Unless people are really yeah. eager to take a break now. Okay, good. I, I, I don't like to make people wait for their break, nope. but uh, okay, Josh, come on up. We're up to FEMA buyout item, which is item number 16 on our agenda. Great. Uh, Josh Strom, Community and Economic Development Specialist. Thank you. Um, here uh, tonight, we're going to talk about property acquisitions, uh, the process and the timeline. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is because of the flood, obviously, in July. Um, there's three properties that um, we're considering um, acquisitions for tonight. Um, 189 State Street, 197 State Street, and 127 Elm Street. Um, all three of these properties um, were um, considered to be substantially damaged during the, the flood event. Um, and all three of these properties are in areas of the community that are considered to be repetitive loss zones. Um, so this, these are zones where we have experienced multiple losses, structural losses during flood events um, over the years. Um, we know this because um, of uh, NFIP information, properties that are on NFIP, um, and just with talking with the property owners. Um, the three properties that we're discussing tonight um, have a grand list um, total of about $897,000, um, and the three properties uh, contribute just about $19,000 um, annually, and that's municipal and education. And these are the red highlighted uh, parcels on these two pictures. Yep. Okay, so why why are properties acquired? Um, one, it's it is a mitigation um, measure um, that communities can use to remove people um, out of harm's way um, for future flooding. Um, you will see property acquisitions for substantially um, damaged structures, um, those that are repetitive loss structures, um, and those that are considered to be severe repetitive loss structures. Um, in this case, like I said, these properties, three of them are were um, 
considered to be substantially damaged um, as a result of the flood, which means the cost of repairing the structure uh, to its before damaged condition is more than 50% of that structure's market value before the disaster event. Um, who acquires the property? It's the community. Um, the community acquires the property. It becomes public property uh, in the transaction. Um, and um, it can only be used as green space in perpetuity. Um, this city can create parks with it, um, river access, wildlife refuges. Um, they can even um, use it for parking um, as long as it's undeveloped and unpaved. Um, this city can also lease it to a private individual. Um, that's something I learned recently this week in the Federal Code of Regulations. Um, it can never sell it to a private individual, although it could sell it to a, a certified conservation organization um, with the intention of obviously placing a conservation easement on it and for using it for conservation purposes. Um, one thing I will uh, also put in there, there are some caveats. Interesting, interestingly enough, um, aqua acquired properties can have public restrooms cited on them. That's just one of the only things that can be developed on an acquired property. Um, just thought I would put that out there. Because the theory is, it's like, this is a very enclosed space. It's, it's only used as restrooms. It can get flooded and can get easily cleaned out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, acquisitions also require voluntary participation from a property owner and a community, right? Tonight we're city council, you all are considering um, acquiring these properties on behalf of the community and the property owners have already indicated their willingness to go through this transaction. How are properties acquired? Usually uh, the funding mechanism that's used for acquisition um, is typically through FEMA, right? They have a, a series of programs, um, hazard mitigation grant program, um, flood mitigation assistance, uh, the BRIC pro program, which is building resilient infrastructure in communities, um, and a newer program uh, called Swift Current, right? Um, the state of Vermont also has a, a fund that they use for acquisition pro projects in the state. That's called the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. Um, it doesn't have as nearly as many resources as the FEMA programs do. Um, and so they're not able to do a, a lot of acquisitions and, and, and projects. Um, how the, the, the programs that we are looking at right now um, are going to be the Swift Current program um, and the Hazard Mitigation Grant program. Those are the two active programs right now. The, the FMA and the BRIC uh, programs had already had deadlines um, that it's already gone past us. Um, Swift Current um, has a deadline in May for an application and Hazard Mitigation Grant program has a deadline um, of June 21st. Although that will be extended because the state of Vermont is allowed to request two 90-day extensions. So realistically, the actual deadline is, is January 25, um, but we're talking about it tonight because we want to get these in the queue immediately. Who is involved in the process? So the city of Montpelier, as I mentioned in previous meetings, um, has signed an MOA memorandum of agreement with Vermont Emergency Management for them to do the administration of all of our acquisition projects. They will be uh, communicating with FEMA um, and, and the FEMA officials on these applications. Uh, in the city, myself, um, we will work with property owners um, to get paperwork filled out and to help um, get to the closing date. Um, 
If there is additional paperwork, which I've been already warned that there will be um, because that's how FEMA operates, um, VM might reach out to the property owner, but more likely they'll reach out to me and then I will help facilitate getting that paperwork um, submitted. So that's the, the sort of the chain of communication uh, between the city, them, FEMA, and the property owner. There's also, uh, how was the value determined? Um, you know, the city is acquiring the property through the state of Vermont, by, you know, as uh, from FEMA funding. Um, and so uh, an a forensic appraisal is used uh, to determine the fair market value of these properties on the day before the flood event. Um, so, you know, eventually Vermont Emergency Management will hire an appraiser and they will do this forensic review um, in the process. Once that value is determined, you know, it's it's then pro, um, uh, provided to the property owner and they can appeal it, they can accept it, um, or they can reject it. Um, if they appeal it, that process requires the property owner to um, hire their own appraisal, uh, own appraiser to do an appraisal. And then that is then given to Vermont Emergency Management and they will hire a third party to review both appraisals to determine what that fair market value should be. And whatever decision that is, is the final. Is there a substantial difference between an ordinary appraisal and a forensic appraisal? Why, I, why, I, why do they call it? Well, because they're looking back in time. Is that the only difference? Because right now, if you did an appraisal of these properties, they wouldn't be worth that much, right? Right. So, but they were the day before the flood. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make sure. Yep. Than anything else. Yeah. Um, so once, yeah, if, if there was that appeal, the, the third party decides what that fair market value is, and that's the final decision. Um, also, usually related to the, the funding mechanisms, there's a cost share. Um, depending on the program, it could be as high as 25% or 0%. In this instance, the state of Vermont, through their fund, is coming up with the match for these acquisitions. So the property owner is not responsible for anything. The city is not responsible for anything. Uh, I think that's a, an important distinction because a lot of the FEMA programs do require a cost share. Um, and fortunately, the, the state has enough funds to, to cover this uh, for these acquisitions. Um, just to walk you through the process. Um, so this is sort of just like the steps of the process and timeline, right? So right now we have uh, application packages to, to kick this off. We're going to have a vote tonight um, by you all. Um, and then we'll get our documents, provided that you agree to uh, accept these properties, um, and we'll get the documents executed our, on our end and then submitted to Vermont Emergency Management. They have a, about a two-week turnaround time that they've implemented to have their project review committee look at it and send it over to FEMA. Um, FEMA's process is much longer. Um, Vermont Emergency Management ha have said that um, recent um, acquisition projects, FEMA's turnaround is usually about nine months. Um, so we're nine to 15 months is what we are an anticipating. Um, so that's, that's out of our hands. That's completely in FEMA's um, hands. Um, once they've made a determination, they will, FEMA, will issue the public notice to proceed. Um, it'll be published in the local paper um, and the project can move forward. Um, from that point, um, Vermont Emergency Management will uh, reach out and contract with the appraisal company or person to do their forensic appraisal, um, title search company, and a construction company to do the demolition and site work. Um, in conversations with them, they are hoping 
to um, have an expedited process to do this because it's an important part of um, getting these done quickly. So they anticipate having like on retainer multiple appraisers, um, a couple different contractors and title um, search individuals so that they can, an acquisition project comes from FEMA, they can reach out and get them to start getting the work done as soon as possible. Um, the anticipated timeline for them to hire these individuals to do this is, is untested really. Um, so it's about one to three months anticipated. It could be quicker. We just don't know. Um, this is completely new for them. It's a new process that they're trying to implement. Um, and then, then there's the closing. That is when the property owner is given the check and um, the community takes ownership of that parcel. Um, the, um, there's a, you know, a restricted deed that's, that's placed on it that, you know, doesn't allow any development on it. Um, but it becomes our property. Um, and then from that closing date, um, by, by statute, um, there's only, we only have 90 days to do the actual demolition, um, and, turn it into green space. Now, depending on when that determination comes in, that could pose an issue in Vermont. Um, and Vermont Emergency Management is aware of that. Um, and in statute, they do have the ability um, to request a waiver um, from the regional administrator. Um, and so they're, they're actively engaged with FEMA uh, to try to address this because Construction season in Vermont is pretty short. I assume the demolition includes excavation and removal of the foundation. Yep. Yeah, it would it would re uh, require um, capping utilities and removing all structural elements on the property uh, and site work uh, to return it to green space. Um, I, I have talked with them about what opportunities the city might have um, while they are um, contracting with, with a construction company, if we want to see certain amenities in these spaces like benches, um, things that would encourage public um, use, uh, we, we might have that ability to affect some of the site work that's completed. Um, so is, could we do something like the, uh, the kind of rain garden they have outside of uh, the credit union? Something else that would be uh, it's it's possible water stormwater mitigation yes yep so um so something to think about um on these properties um at that time um so from today it's looking like a year to a year and a half yeah um you know just to recap um for the property owner to get um paid we're looking at 10 to 18 months Worst case scenario, hopefully it's 18 months. Best case, it's it's about 10 months. Um, for the site to be demolished, for the structure to be demolished and turned into green space, once it's all done, we're looking at 13 to 21 months. Um, I There's a buffer in here. You know, I asked VM, what do you anticipate as a turnaround time from FEMA? They say, well, we're experiencing nine months but we don't know what this next round of acquisitions are going to be like. So I'm uh, trying to sort of like set expectations um, mm -hmm. with the unknown. Um, so just, you know, just recapping, uh, VM will handle all communications with FEMA. Um, we'll handle communications with the property owners uh, in the process. Um, there's no cost to the property owner or the city for the acquisition. Uh, because the cost match will come through the state of Vermont. Um, and I just mentioned the timeline um, and the parcels being acquired um, can never be developed, um, can never in the future, um, can never have housing on there uh, again. Um, so any questions? 
I might have missed this, but what's the cost of the demolition? Who who pays for that? The state. The state. Yeah. What about um I think I read somewhere that the the property owners are qualified for tax abatement. Will that be um through this time period? Will it be extended? Like what does that process look like? So they're not incurring additional costs as they're waiting to go through the FEMA process. The the Board of Abatement has already uh held uh, abatement hearings on uh on properties that have, that were determined to be substantially uh, damaged and granted uh, 100% tax abatement for the for the current tax year and we presumably do the same the future year cuz it, cuz it's not there's still going to be owners into the next taxable year probably I think I know the answer to this question but I'm going to ask it anyway because I know how FEMA works, but in in compensating the landowner for this, do they also, because people are incurring costs now. I mean, when you say it's no cost, they're, people have costs, they're renting, they're doing whatever they're doing, is, is you know what I mean? So the, I, I am a, is that part of the compensation? Do you know? or I'm not 100% sure on whether or not part of it would cover costs that they're incurring now right i'm not 100 percent sure on that yeah might we'll see if we can poke that there yeah anybody else with other questions okay i see some people here in the room if i uh, want to invite comments from from you folks if you want to if you have anything you'd like to say Yeah, all, all three property owners are either in here in person or online. Ed Haggett, 197 State Street. I have applied for a buyout. Thank you to Josh. Um, he's been helping. And your presentation is wonderful. It's a bit fluffy, in my opinion. Uh, the timeline... It's normally three to five years. There's, on um, it, you know, it's been longer. Um, one property in Waterbury took nine years. Just last summer, <clears throat> it was bought out um, after Irene. It's nice to say that these people are going to do all these things in a very timely manner. That does not happen. And when I hear the zoning things and I hear uh, about buyouts, so you're going to have a buyout in our neighborhood, you're going to have a buyout here and a buyout here. Um, there's been no discussion about, I know this is going to sound crazy, but the state, the route two is in a different kind of flood zone now. And you may find that route two can't be where it is in the future due to FEMA regulations or whatever. So you're going to have some elevation. You're going to have some green spaces. You're going to have a myriad of different things in, in these neighborhoods. And it will just look crazy. High here, nothing here, not high here because it's historic and they don't have to do anything. Uh, high here and then low here. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I have I have no choice. My choice is when you're substantially damaged, you either have to um, get it bought out or you have to demolish it yourself. I'm in no position to do that. I'm still unhoused. And, you know, elevation money may not come for another year, but I'm finding myself having to do the buyout. And at the same time, if the elevation application becomes available, I need to apply for the elevation also because I don't know if FEMA, FEMA rules are very tough, 
is are going to buy my house out. I just don't know. I have to have these options open. Either I may have to bite it and elevate it, or it, they may not approve any. There's a, a cost-benefit analysis that FEMA requires. And if you don't meet that for elevation or buyout, they're not going to do it. You, I, you just identified a question that Josh may be able to answer. How how does is there a possible that FEMA that we go through this whole process and FEMA says we're not paying for a buyout for a particular property? And how would that how would that work? Um, any property that is determined to be substantially damaged, uh, FEMA automatically considers to be cost beneficial for an acquisition project. If it wasn't, I'd include this um, in the sort of presentation because none of these are, they're, they're all substantially damaged. So mm -hmm. if there was a property that was not sub substantially damaged, um, most likely in this community, a benefit cost analysis would be needed because the threshold is 360,000. So any acquisition project greater than 360,000 requires a full benefit cost analysis. Mm -hmm. In this case, these three, they don't need to go through that. So you're, you don't really see that it's a reasonable prospect that FEMA would say, no, we're not doing this. No. Okay. Okay, one thing I have learned is I've gotten a lot of lip service for the past nine months. And lots of times it doesn't turn out to be what I was told. So take what you hear with a grain of salt. It goes in one ear and out the other because you don't know what's going to happen when the brass tacks start falling. Thank thanks, you. Thanks for being here. And... I, I know that whatever we can do to accelerate this process will be done. Um, did you want to make a comment? You should go to Mary and Katie first. Okay, and Mary, I saw on your uh, saw you on the screen. Great, thank you, thank you, everyone. I'm I'm just appreciative of um, the process and the attention. Thank you so much, Josh, for your presentation and doing so much information gathering and um, presenting to, to the council and all of us. I just would like to uh, reiterate, and I think that I have done this the last time we met, that this has been a, a long and stressful process. And it looks as though in terms of money coming from the from legislators to lift our properties may or may not happen. And even if that were to happen down the road, I am just out of capacity at this point. I have a demanding job as a special educator, which requires so much of, of me. <laughs> and um, the thought of rebuilding at this point, I'm just really out of juice. And um, I'm going to trust in the buyout process. And I just would like to invite and urge City Council to approve this acquisition so that folks who do indeed, like myself, choose a buyout um, have a way to become whole again and to um, put this process behind us and um, find new, more permanent safe housing. Thank you. Katie, do you want to be heard? You don't have to. You need to unmute if you do. Oh, there we go. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um and will you start by introducing yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Katie Swick and I own um 127 Elm Street with um Kirby Keaton. And um, but I've been living here um supporting the house for three years now. Um and 
I'm currently not living in the home, still waiting for FEMA to pay for some rental assistance um, in another place. And yes, it's a very challenging process of still many months of turning in paperwork and not getting anywhere. Um, so hopefully that will come through. Um, I just want to say it's a really hard decision to decide to take a buyout and to tear down a, a house that's been a part of this community since 1860. Um, I find it challenging, but it seems like like the other two have said that got to go with the options that are there right now and, and go forward with this buyout because it could take many, many months. We don't know and still waiting on possibilities of elevation um, money. So it's kind of People always ask me what I'm going to do, and it's it just it's hard to say with some not having a lot of answers and waiting for answers and seeing where things go. Um, but you know, maybe the the this house has been flooded many times before in those years, many many years. So maybe it's just time for it to be a park where everybody can enjoy it. I'd love to see it a place where um, it's river access and people are actually can access the river in this part of the the city. There's not there's not access to the river and it's a beautiful spot um, when it's not flooded. And um, yeah, I, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Good. Thanks, uh, Kirby. I just have a quick question. Well, wait, Ed, Ed, we have some, we've just uh, recognized someone else. I thought you nodded at me. I, I was just holding my finger up to have you pause. So go ahead, Kirby. Thank you. Thank you, City Council. Uh, yeah, so I'm the other person on the deed at 127 Elm Street. And I do have a clarifying question for Josh. And um, I heard that the, the FEMA full cost analysis uh, would take place for a property that's valued at 360000 or more. That, that's the threshold. Um, uh, Josh seemed to think that uh, none of these properties apply to that, but uh, the 127 Elm Street property does have a, an appraisal that was done right before the flood that set it at 425000 And I understand that maybe Josh is basing it off of property valuation numbers, but property valuation numbers, of course, are typically much lower than actual fair market value for an appraisal. Um, so I just want to understand better if maybe there's uh, going to be another, some, some full cost analysis and what that would entail if it turns out that a property is actually more than, or worth more than 360,000. Um, so I can, I can stop with that and, and wait for the question or wait for the answer. Yeah, Kirby. Um Every property that's determined to be substantially damaged is not required to go through the benefit cost analysis because FEMA already considers it to be a good deal to acquire the property. If it wasn't determined to be substantially damaged, then the 360000 is in play and um, it most likely would have to go through a BCA calculation. But because yours... And the other two are substantially damaged. That requirement uh, for B for a BCA calculation does not apply. That, that's really helpful. Thank you, Josh. Yep. Thanks, um, Mr. Haggett. I think you had another question. Ed Haggett, one ninety seven State Street. Josh, do they do you have to take off your the money you receive from flood insurance off the top of the? So what um, one of the forms that you had filled out indicated like the, the benefits, right? Right. Um, that you would receive. So those come off the top. Like a duplication of benefits. I I don't know how FEMA handles that. I know if you're an NFIP property, they probably do take that off the top. Uh, I know you're not an NFIP property, right? What, what does that mean? National Flood Insurance Program. I am not, I had a private carrier. Right. Um, so I, I can get a follow-up answer to yeah. that, um, for you tomorrow. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I would also like to know the answer to that. Sure. Thank, thank you. Great. Anybody else want to be heard? Okay. Come on up. 
So I'm Lisa Edson Neva, and I'm at 191 State Street, which isn't on this list because we're the only ones living there. I have two children. We're living in the house. We've been living in the house this entire time. There have been no benefits from FEMA. My benefits were less than $5,000 given within the first 10 days to help support commuting back and forth between an alternative residence where we were staying on couches. We have received nothing. We have received only in the insurance money. We've received the substantially damaged letter and actually having a bunch of public restrooms next door isn't actually that appealing although that may be a surprise. This whole process has been awful. And in doing this, no one's even acknowledging the fact that we're still there. Nobody's acknowledging the fact that we're the only ones there that are trying to raise this property. Our property is almost 4,000 square feet. We currently have one apartment that has been totally vacant for the last year, which we rely on that income. We're a single income household. And if we were to get bought out, it would leave us homeless with nothing because the bank owns our property. We only bought in 2017. There's a not, we have so little equity in this that if this process happens, it leaves us homeless with nothing. If your car got stolen today, you would expect to go through the process and file your insurance claim. And you would expect within a reasonable time period to have that vehicle replaced or to get a check of a, a similar value. I have homeowner's insurance. I have flood insurance. The flood insurance paid out at hardly half. And now they're using that as justification as to why my house may not be substantially damaged, even though you all determined that it was. The lack of support on this and the fact that we're one household means we don't exist. No one's offering anything to help us. No one's offering us a place to live. We do not have a kitchen. We do not have a first floor bathroom. We do not have walls. We have subfloors and no one is paying any attention. And, you know, I keep hearing everyone talk about a quick response for nine months. In Vermont, I have cooked on the grill. The good thing is we didn't have winter, so it made it a lot easier, but we're cooking on the grill. I made spaghetti on the grill tonight before I left my kids to come here because there is no support. There are no funding. And when people talk about this FEMA support, I don't know who's getting it. We've gotten nothing. We just want to rebuild our house. The national flood insurance is paying so little we can't possibly redo what was taken out more or less the cost of raising it a minimum of seven to 10 feet. And none of this is being addressed. So are we just gonna be pushed out into homelessness with nothing? And so I just wanna make sure that we don't get lost in this because we're one household. Our house had not been flooded on the first floor since 1927. In the flood six months before FEMA, it hit our basement and it was remediated. Since we've owned it in 2017, at least a couple times a year, we see the waters come over the, the road, which is well over that 11 foot mark. That's a flood point. The patterns have changed, but we shouldn't be pushed out. We're looking at having three units. The amount it would cost to raise our house is less than what you would pay to demolish our house and leave it green in perpetuity. And so we're looking to not be lost in this. And even though we're one, to not be lost in it. We're living there right now. And when you go by, you'll see our lights, you'll see our, our decorations. We're there every day. So Josh, that raises the question. We've been, tonight's agenda is specifically about the uh, buyout program, but uh, where's the assistance and what assistance is there for elevations? So, I mean, there's one, there's kind of two tracks um, with this because, you know, there's one track of like trying to wait for the state um, to, to pass funding, right? There was $2 million that we had requested specifically for elevations um, and the legislature does not seem inclined to in include that um, right now. So point of clarification on that. So it was not included in the budget adjustment and I'm just going to sign today. It is still under active consideration. But it was but, removed the night before. 
was it? Yeah. We did not receive notification. We didn't know they were pulling it out. It feels really underhanded that it was in there until the very last minute. And then it gets pulled out without any notification to the community. How, I mean, how is it that we're support? I, and I'm all for supporting the businesses. I am not saying anything plus, but where are we? Why are we lost in this? Well, obviously we don't know why the legislature does what it does. And we, we've pushed as hard, you know, on them as hard as we can and are continuing to do so to ask them for the funding in, in this budget that they're working on still now. Um, I don't know why they pulled it out of there. I mean, budget even adjustment. if they do that, you realize that's a year after we flooded. I, I do. And I'm really hoping the 514,000 that came to the city for emergency relief for flooding doesn't get spent on a new development while there is no support for those of us that already live here, that are already paying the taxes, that are already living in this state, meaning in, in the conditions, I don't mean in Vermont. This is terrible. And we're getting ignored because there are too few of us. Josh, do you know, is there any more that you yeah, know? Um, well, so the state is one path forward. Um, and actually, the second path is with FEMA. Um, actually had a meeting with Vermont Emergency Management this morning about elevations. Um, and so I think we have a list of properties that we feel are good elevation um, candidates. Um, Lisa, I know, I know that you're on the list. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, we're trying to identify exactly who is willing to move forward with an elevation application. Like I said, uh, FEMA has a couple of different um, funding rounds in, in action right now. The SWIFT current one has a May 15 deadline and the, and the hazard mitigation grant program has a June 21 deadline. And so what we're trying to develop is a, a phase elevation project. What we would do is we would package uh, a portfolio of elevation projects together and submit that to FEMA. Mm -hmm. And the phase one part of it would be to do uh, the surveying work. You know, you need a elevation certificate um, and you need to have uh, a design of the new structure um, because FEMA requires certain structural requirements um, to meet flows of future flooding. Um, so that would be the first phase to do that work. And then in the second phase would be the actual implementation projects itself. Now, I admit what I heard this morning about the timeline was pretty discouraging. Um, and so it's not a very quick turnaround process. Um, so what does that look like? Um, we were told that if we submit a phase project now or in the next couple months, they didn't um, expect FEMA to give us a decision until sort of later in this in the year. So it's it's. So you're talking about 18 months before we even know whether they're willing to consider it. And if we go with this, so what? When you say an elevation application, what funding potentially could be there? Um, so again, depends on the program. And because elevations are much trickier than acquisition projects, um, elevations, because of federal requirements, have to look at environmental and historic character of properties. And there is a benefit cost analysis threshold that can come into play. Um, that threshold is $228,000. I guess one of the more encouraging pieces is that some of the estimates that we've heard about for elevation projects can range from 140,000 up to 200,000 um, that some of like the 140,000 ones is just the elevation closer to 200,000 is the elevation and new foundation work because you need to have a new foundation in order to put the structure on. Um, so really, in the historic character piece of the structures, that's where the properties in Waterbury after Irene, that's where they ran into issues because the cost to keep the historic character of some of the properties push the project over that threshold, which then triggered FEMA to say this isn't cost beneficial and didn't qualify. 
some of the strategies that we would try to use to try to figure out early on if that's going to play um, is to actually use the, the benefit cost analysis tool that FEMA has and try to work in some of the anticipated costs associated with keeping the historic character. Instead of waiting down the line when that's done by FEMA, um, so that would be some of the the front up upfront costs or upfront work that we would try to do with property owners, um, just so that we have a better sense because we don't we don't know that FEMA could come back and they might say, well, this this structural elevation um, to keep its historic character is going to put it over the threshold and not qualify. Josh, perhaps I mixed it, but how much money is available if they were to authorize it? Is it an authorization of a full amount? I don't know of anything. I and and I'm saying because I do not know. I have not heard of FEMA paying anything for elevations. Yeah. How much money would if we went through this 18 month process and got approved through everything that has to be approved? What's available? Well, it's based on the project. Okay. So, again, projects can vary depending on the structure. That's, that's needing to get elevated, how high it needs to get elevated, right? So again, 220,000 is the threshold to require a full benefit cost analysis by FEMA. So if you can, if some, some structures can elevate to the required elevation um, and get it designed, that's less than 228,000, then, FEMA considers it to be cost beneficial and they will approve that project. So this is above the 30,000 through increased cost of compliance, because as far as I know, I haven't been able to find anyone that has received more than the 30,000. So, so the, does the, anyone receive more than 30,000? 30... Has to wait 18 months for potentially 30,000. Well, we live with no kitchen and no walls. Doesn't sound that great. The the 30,000 is, is a separate sort of, program called uh, increased cost of compliance mm -hmm. that is made available to NFIP uh, insured properties mm -hmm. who are substantially damaged. The intent of that money is to be used to help with mitigation expenses like an elevation certificate or design work on a new structure. That's what the intent is. It's not just to be like, this is the only amount of money that you're getting, but it's in addition to, to help start a project to get some of that work done sooner. Have we seen in Vermont that Folks, occur? Uh, Mike, do you have an answer? I think what she's asking, so of the 200,000. Thank you. So I think what she's asking is how much money she would get. So if it's a $200,000 elevation, you would get 75% of that, which would be $150,000 from FEMA to elevate the house. You'd then use the $30,000 from the cost of compliance to get you $180,000. And that's where we would start having to have conversations about what are we doing about the delta of the gap of what's left. But we don't, again, there's so many variables between here and there. I believe, and you can correct me, the FEMA program pays 75% of the cost of elevating the house. That doesn't count if there's insurance money, you can put insurance money into that. You can put cost of compliance into that. Right. Um, Thanks. Those I, types of things. Thank you. I, I think we're, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in at this point and say, I think you need to continue to be in uh, communication with, uh, with Josh and Mike to uh, move forward. And I, I want to move forward with, uh, with this agenda item because uh because that's what we're on for tonight. Okay, and it's worth knowing that the things that Josh said today about decisions that be, are being made, I don't know about any of those. That's why I'm here. We aren't hearing things. We don't know what's going on. And it's month after month after month. And I'm really hoping that I'm not looking at two years before a decision is even made about what could potentially happen. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking to Mike and Josh to keep us updated on how this process is going. I, I assure you that you are not being ignored. Um, 
So, Josh, what you're looking for to tonight is an approval of the uh, acquisition plan. Yeah. Is there a motion to approve the acquisition plan? I'll move to approve the acquisition plan. And is there a second? second. Any further discussion? Helen. I just want to support and help all the households had this like incredible distraction but i didn't hear any solutions for one household and we talk about it it's a voluntary process and i'm hearing that at least one household is not volunteering but they are getting affected and negatively affected so what is the uh, solution for this issue how we can help all of them at the same time and if we cannot help, I don't know. Again, I want to support everyone, but I don't know if it is the right um, path to go. So is there any solution can we offer that one household? Um, I, well, we, we don't have any basis to do it. It is also, okay. I mean, uh, it's actually. really, it's just a factor of money, right? We, we have to use the FEMA process because they have the money. And so um, until the state approves funding that we can use for elevation projects, we're really at the mercy of FEMA's programs because I, I'm not aware of extra money from the city to help with any of these mitigation projects. And, you know, there's acquisitions, there's elevations, and then there's a whole downtown that we need to consider how to flood proof because we're going to, we're going to flood again. Um, and so there's other, there's other projects, um, that we, we are working on, um, that will have to be considered with FEMA with their, through their program. So I wish it was a different answer, but we have to work with who has the purse strings. So you're willing to pay the money to make us homeless, but not the same amount of money to make it so we have three units going forward. Nobody's talking about paying money to make you homeless okay. and and the acquisition. It's the same amount of money we're looking at to raise our house. The, the acquisition program, which is before us now, is not affecting someone like you. Who, and I appreciate your decision not your d desire not to be bought out but the buyout doesn't affect someone who's not choosing to be bought out yeah, i mean the different what the city's doing and i i you know i was going to respond to to palin is that there are different programs and choices three of the people have opted to pursue the buyout i think ms edson explained why it doesn't really work for her given the mortgage and everything else it was a good uh, logic. And so she's pursuing a different path through FEMA, which is, I think, more complicated and difficult. Uh, and we are trying to help all the people equally get through the programs, but they're not our programs, they're federal programs, and they're complicated. We've been advocating for state money, which would help speed these things up. And um, hopefully we can, we can get that. And, you know, I think in terms of the city being willing to spend the same money, I, th I think if it was up to us, We'd take FEMA's money and give everybody what they needed for what they wanted to do. Well, you know, they don't really give us the choice. I think our choice is saying, if they are bought out through the FEMA process, will we accept the land in perpetuity and say, I can't, you know, knowing that we're foregoing future, you know, public or private use of that land. That's what the city's being asked to do to approve that process. Similarly, if we were to approve a process and there was a match component and we might be need to put in some money on the match for your program, we'd be asked, are we willing to do that? And we're, we're not at that point with the elevation process. We are at with that point now with the buyout. So I don't think anyone's, I, speaking for myself and what I'd recommend to the council through our department, we're not recommending that we don't do anything for anybody. We're trying to move these processes along as quickly as we can. But there are two different processes. Three people are choosing a buyout and one is choosing an elevation. And so you're on sort of different roads. Yeah, different processes. Yes. They do not affect each other. That's, yeah, I was it's trying to buy out the three doesn't change whether what we do for, for Lisa. Yeah. And if we're getting money from the state, if the state 
legislature is saying, well, we're, they're going to appropriate money to cover the city's 25% match. I would like us to be advocating to the legislature to say they're going to make up the 25% from the 75% that FEMA is giving for, uh, for elevations too. And I don't know where that's going to be in the conversation, but that's a longer term thing. Yes. Are we ready to vote on the motion to approve the uh, program? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you, Josh. We have uh, approved that, and uh, we'll keep working on your your part of it. And now, do you have a. I think I asked maybe the last time you were here. Do you have a cost estimate for your? We've already submitted because we wanted to move forward months ago, and were asked by the city to stop until the um, adjustment. Act went through. Well, we could talk later about the numbers. Yeah. We don't need to do it in public. I'm just curious. We will go into our 10 minute break now. So return at 9 uh, 32. All right. Let's uh, come back to order. And Bill, you are up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, there's a reason why we normally try to have the first meeting of the new council not have anything substantive on it. Obviously, we failed that drastically tonight, but uh, you took care of far more important things. Uh, and you've already elected your officers and adopted your policies and appointed your committee. So you've done a lot of good work tonight. Um, I do want to like to run through this. I will try to do it more quickly. For uh, most of you, it will be a rerun. Um, for Councilmember Gill, it will be new. Um, but I suspect for uh, the the th I need to share my screen. I thought you did that. I have said it yet. Oh, I'm happy to I thought you go ahead. Sorry, and did you start over, Bill? <laughs> no, I'm not repeating. I thought that's what you did when you. Oh no, no. Oh, I thought that's how that happened. Sorry. That's all right. Okay. You're good now. You're actually I'm good. ready. I'm ready. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, but I can move Mr. Jones over to the side here. Okay. Um, so, and I suspect for the three of you that were hearing this the first time last year, um, some of this may resonate more than it did last year, um, now that you've done the full cycle. So I will try to speed it up, but I, you know, there is a lot of important information here. So I, I would like to beg your indulgence and try to get through it uh, if we can, uh, but if it gets to be too long. So, Quickly, I will not read this. Uh, I, in, you do have this in your packets. The Athenian Oath, which was from ancient Athens about the city leaders. And I think the, the most important line is that, you know, we will transmit the city not only, not less, but greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. So that is our sort of mission ultimately as public officials and kind of the holders of Montpelier right now is to do our part to move it further down the road as we go. Things I want to talk about are governance and council operations, uh, what everyone's roles are, what policy making looks like, which is most of yours, uh, very quick summary of city operations departments and facilities, um, what some of our current projects are, and again, this will be at very high level, and then charting the course moving forward for the next uh, few months. Uh, so quickly, governance and council operations, I think the most important piece of all of this is that we are what's called a Dillon's Rule state. And that is a legal term, but what that means is that we are a state where towns and cities have no independent authority in and of themselves. They only have what is granted to them by the legislature. So as much as we like to think about home rule in Vermont and New England and all that stuff, actually New England is a very strong bastion of Dillon's Rule states. So town meeting and all of that is great, uh, but you can only do what the state authorizes. Hence the city charter, which is uh, approved by the, the legislature. And then the state statutes, uh, Title 24 in particular, lay out the powers of uh, cities and towns. Um, so often we'll hear, you know, the city should just do such and such. And oftentimes we are not able to do that. It is not, we are not empowered to do that. That's sometimes why we seek charter changes. Uh, to, to, to anyway, that's that's the key. That's just the, the most important part is we do not 
We are a subdivision of the state. You may notice the oath that you took today. The very first thing you swore was allegiance to the state and its constitution before you actually swore allegiance to the city because we are political subdivisions of the state. We operate under a council manager form of government. Uh, that is a term of art in, in local government. There are many different types. That's the one we're in. This council is the legislative or governing body. And people get confused with this. The council is the mayor and the sixth council member. Together, the seven of you are the city council. The authority that you have and the, the, the sort of the weight of the city government comes from the actions that you take as a whole. So certainly each of you are important, especially to me. I, you know, I'm trying to be available to all of you as many as we can. And certainly with constituent concerns and those kind of things will work on you. But in terms of speaking as a city council, it is your role as a group. And to do that, you need four votes, not just a majority of those present. You need actually four votes. So if there's only four of you present for a meeting, you still need four votes to pass an action. And that is in state statute. I think sometimes it gets confused. There's five people here to three, two vote it passed. No, it didn't. Um, so that's that. Um, the mayor, uh, by tradition, not necessarily legally, but our, our tradition here is the mayor can vote to break a 3-3 tie or to make a fourth vote or can choose not to. So again, there's six people here. It's a 3-2 vote. The mayor can either choose to make that fourth vote or not. That is mayor's prerogative. Um, the mayor may veto any action of the council, provided they do so before the next regularly scheduled council meeting, and five votes of the council can overturn the mayor's veto. Probably happened four times in my career here. The council appoints city manager, the treasurer, our attorneys, and boarding committee members, and then the city manager is the chief administrative officer for all operations. So, oh, I already stole some of my thunder. The mayor presides over the meetings. You elect your officers. The mayor makes the tie. You've already adopted all of those things. You can create committees, subcommittees. Typically, the regular meetings are scheduled for second and fourth Wednesday. They can be changed by group decision, as you did for April, where they are the first and third Wednesdays, but normally. Uh, you will get a weekly memo sent to you. Uh, that describes things that are going on in the various committees and departments. And it also includes uh, tentative schedules for upcoming council meetings. And then we have an annual strategic planning session at some point over the, the course of the year. This year, as you know, everything got compressed uh, with the flood. So it was later than we had expected. Again, most of your old hat now. So I'll skip over for a council meeting. Uh, basically, you get the agenda and the weekly memo. Each agenda item typically has a cover sheet with the high points of background information, and we try to be clear with a recommendation for action. If we're really on top of our game, the recommended action is the motion we would like you to pass or we're suggesting you pass. You can certainly pass whatever you want. Then it includes the review of the agenda. That is a state law, by the way, that we review and approve any agenda. It's also the time you can add something new if it's unexpected. General businesses and appearances is when citizens can make their public comment. The consent agenda, as you all know, is uh, a group of items that are considered uh, administrative or routine in nature that you can pass all at once. Any one council member can pull an item off for discussion if they'd like to. Um, and certainly, and if there are questions on this consent agenda, uh, we certainly appreciate if we get those in advance so we can be prepared to answer them or answer you before it even has to get pulled off. Um, public hearings, we held one tonight. They're slightly different because the mayor will open and close the public hearing and there's usually a period of time for public comment and then the council, then it, the public hearing is closed and the council will have its discussions. At the end of every meeting, you have a council report. It's your chance to say what you want about almost anything. And then occasionally we go into executive session. There's a very specific set of laws. And in the handbooks, you'll notice you all have handbooks on your desk. That's the, we update that every year with some changes. Uh, and in it are the public records law and the uh, open meeting law. So the open meeting law in particular sets out the rules for executive sessions. Uh, and they're very specific and we, Try to have as few as possible, but when we do, we always follow the statute to uh, why we go in. Uh, this is the cover sheet that you get. Um, most of you have seen these. And Councilmember McGill, if I'm going too fast on any of these, either stop me or keep a note and we can talk about it on our Monday meeting. Yep. Just so 
the, I'm not going to go through all these, but I, I would say these are very important things for you as a council member to to know and be familiar with. The open meeting law, absolutely. Uh, that really is uh, the public records law. Uh, the short version of that is anything, if you assume that any document that you get, any email you send is a public record, that's wise. There may be things that are exempt, but don't start with the idea, oh, this is probably exempt. Assume that it could be subject to public request. And so think about that when you're writing something. Uh, the ethics policy you approved tonight, very important because it, it really sets a high bar for how we conduct ourselves and your rules of procedure and then the code of conduct for meetings, which the council adopted uh, recently. Agenda preparation, we try to close. I know there was a request. <laughs> We're still trying to figure out if we can get more done earlier, but typically uh, we close our agenda by noon on Friday. Uh, and for the public, um, we are really trying to tell them end of business on Thursday. Obviously, uh, if it's you folks, we can make an exception for that. Uh, there is occasionally changes that come in on Monday and Tuesday. We try to keep those to a minimum, but sometimes they do happen. Um, any council member can add an item to an agenda. The easiest way to do it is during your council report, just to say, hey, I'd like to add this to the next agenda, but you can certainly do it by email. You can call me, you do whatever, um, and we'll help you. Sometimes people will say, I want to talk about something. And so we'll say, well, what is it you want to talk about? Like what, we, we're not trying to edit you. We're trying to help you shape it into a productive agenda and not just some open-ended thing. Uh, so again, things you want to know, the budget process, we'll spend more time with that. And I think there was some desire in the council to revisit how we do that. Just knowing the annual elections, town meeting deadlines, there's a specific process for approving bonds that is different than uh, the council. Charter change process has its own dates. And again, then once we vote it, like the, the citizens just voted the change on uh, just cause eviction, that still has to go to the legislature. So it's still the legislature does anything with it and the governor signs it, it's it's still not in our charter. We have an ordinance adoption process and a zoning process. Even though the zoning is an ordinance, it has different processes under state rule than regular ordinance adoption. So just being aware of that. And I did say this last year, and I don't think anyone paid much attention, but as council members, you're also members of the Board of Civil Authority and the Board of Abatement. And um, that was, yeah. <laughs> and um, so the, you do hear abatements, you hear tax appeals, and uh, many of you got many gold stars for that this year. I uh, just want to point out that uh, although we have a council manager form of government, uh, there are still certain positions and roles that have independent authority. So it also comes up sometimes about why, you know, what the council can and can't do. So the city clerk is elected. They have total independent authority over their operations. Uh, obviously, we work very cooperatively with our city clerk and, and they're part of our team, but they have final say over elections, over land records, over any operations with their office. I am not their boss. You're not their boss. Um, they're their own boss. The voters are their boss. Uh, but we do have a good role. Cemetery Commission, same thing. They're going to come in. Well, actually, yes, one of you might be their boss. That is true. But I was trying to keep that up. <laughs> um, the Cemetery Commission is also its own independently elected board. They're going to come in and present to you at one of the upcoming meetings about how they function. The Parks Commission is also independently elected. That's a little interesting because the, the parks are also a department of the city. So the employee, Alec, is an employee of the city manager, but the parks have sort of control of the policies of the parks, the rules and those kind of things, but the city council still has to approve any ordinance changes. So if they want to ban dogs or something like that, it would still, they could vote to do that, but the, the, it would require the council to take that action. So there's, there's kind of an interesting um, interaction between the parks commission, but generally, you know, if it's a decision to create a new trail or, do whatever that is the purview of the parks commission wouldn't normally come to the city council uh and then of course the board of civil authority and board of the abatement you take those actions um and all of that the uh recreation board is appointed by the council and uh, they form a similar role for the rec department uh, again there's not binding they can't you know spend the money they can't enact ordinances but they might make decisions of, you know, we're going to run this league this year or, you know, should, we haven't had much attendance. Should we, you know, certain operational things with the rec, they help. They're a citizen advisory board. 
The Development Review Board that you appoint makes independent decisions on uh, zoning applications or variances, the ones that go to them. This council has no say in those, and in fact, it's inappropriate. They're a quasi-judicial body, and the council should not be in any way trying to interfere or influence any member of the DRB on a matter that's before that. If that matter gets appealed to court, then it falls. In fact, with any of these groups, if once it, something goes to court, then the council is now the legal agent for the city, and then you can settle it. Then you can get involved, but not until then. The treasurer as well. The treasurer is appointed by the council, used to be elected, uh, but the treasurer has, there are independent duties in statutes that a treasurer does. City manager doesn't do them, finance director doesn't do them, the, you don't do them. So the treasurer has a role. And then there are, even under the city manager, um, there are people that I appoint that have very specific authorities that I cannot interfere with. So I appoint an assessor, but I have no say in the actual assessments that they grant, nor like the whole grievance process. And, you know, that makes sense, right? There shouldn't be a political weighing in of, you know, stick it to Mr. Alfano, but give a break to Mr. Heaney, right? It, it should be based on the facts and the records and, um, and those kind of things. The same thing with the fire chief and the police chief, obviously administratively, operationally, I have say over them, but it, the statutes are very clear at certain emergency scenes, um, at the, the emergency at a fire scene, the fire chief's in charge, not anybody else. And um, the police chief, I can't interfere with arrests. I can't direct arrests to be made. I can't, you know, patrol. So, so, and uh, DPW director, I think, has some authority over certain connections. So, even though these people are employees of the city, the director reports to me, mm -hmm. the laws provide specific authorities for them. So, that's a little bit different than maybe, say, a private company where you know, you can tell them what to do. These this case is there as public laws. I'm not going to read all these, but I just say these are key resources that you should uh, take a look at, um, you know, by next week. Uh, no, but it, <laughs> over the course of your time, these are all things that will come into play that you'll hear about uh, over the course of the year. The charter, the council handbook that you just got, our website, the budget, all of these things. Uh, their various plans. And the last one I put on there is the Vermont statutes. And I, I mentioned that because we are a creature of the Vermont statutes, particularly Title 24. And then uh, Title 24 um, is a subsection that has all the charters and inner charters in there. So those are important sections that we refer to all the time. So any questions about that part, about government governance and operations of the council? And I know I was kind of going a million miles an hour. Okay, clear as mud. I did mention Board of Civil Authority. Um, so I put this slide in because it's just a good reminder that what the council deals with at council meetings is really the top part of the iceberg. That's the policy area. That is the things that people are interested in. Those are kind of long-term public facing things. And the area under the iceberg is really the operation of city government. The thing that's going on all the time, the, the fact that there are firefighters in that building right now, the fact that there are police officers and dispatchers in that building right now, the fact that if it started snowing, people would be coming out. Those are all things that are always happening. The, the water plant is running on automatic pilot right now. The sewer plant is doing its thing. So these are all the, the workings of city government. And what the council and we try to do as leaders is to take the vision that we have for the community and the capacity that to do that work and then what our external authority might go along with so you know you the council might think something's a really great idea but we don't really have the, either the money or the staff or the equipment to do it or you might think it's a good idea and we might know how to do it but we haven't convinced the voters yet so that external authority or the in some cases the external authority might be the state government we want them to approve something so that, that can change. In my case, the external authority might be you folks, right? We have a got an idea as a staff. We have a vision. We think we can do it. You all aren't there yet. So, and obviously the goal is to um, make that look more like this, where, um, see, it's supposed to be a PowerPoint where you just click it, but this thing doesn't have PowerPoint on it yet. So we have to scroll it. So, but anyway, where those, those circles are much more concentric. And, um, and, you know, the, the I, my favorite example of this is snow plowing, right? Everyone thinks we should snow plow. Everyone, 
you know, it's the vision of the public works department city manager that we should snowplow. The external authority, the council and public think we should snowplow. And guess what? We have plows, we have blades, we have wings, we have people that do it, right? Lined up. There's there's no controversy over whether we should we should plow snow. But there are other things as we look at it. Is this a capacity issue? Is this a getting people on board issue, or do we're just not seeing it yet? Uh, Okay, so just taking a look at this, who's, who falls in these roles? Obviously, you can see that the external authority is the voters, the governments, you folks as elected officials. The vision comes from you folks and elected officials and maybe with some help from us as, as we see this and or at least for how to operate. We might have a vision for how each department might operate. And then the capacity is really up to me and our staff and our volunteers to come up with that or to rec make recommendations if we need funding or whatever to do that capacity and to tell you how that works. Uh, just taking a look at everyone here. So the voters, what do they do? They elect you, they vote on budgets and bonds, they engage in local discussions, they are the external authority. So they are, interestingly enough, they are owners because they are basically the stockholders, the stakeholders of the community, but they're also customers, right? So they, they, uh, they uh, participate in both controversy and complaints. And I want to talk about that for a minute because it will come up later in this presentation. So a controversy is something like, should we do something? So this wasn't particularly controversial, but like zoning density, right? We just had a con that's a clearly a controversy that you can settle. So if, if there's a disagreement, right? Like right now there's a small c controversy over the school budget. So the so the residents are laying in and then the elected officials are trying to figure out how to solve that controversy. That's different than a complaint. A complaint is, you know, my road didn't get plowed. My, you know, street needs a, a this. The police didn't show up in time. I, you know, I got pulled over for speeding and I shouldn't have. So those are those are different things. And so if we think about it that the controversies, it's really important that they take place here. I can't resolve a controversy for someone. On the other hand, you should you can hear the complaints. People will come in and make complaints here. The council shouldn't be spending a lot of its time fixing complaints. You can check to make sure they're getting taken care of, but that's not the best use of your time as a group. So we try to think about that. So as we go forth, right, the mayor and the city council, it's your job to establish the visit, vision, policy, values, and goals through our various processes. So the strategic plan, city plan. And, you know, the last three months, you've really been doing the most important policy things. You're deciding how to collect and spend the public's money. And you're, you know, basically setting the community standards for zoning, how someone uses their property. Those are the two biggest policies that you do in and out. Spending, taxing, what fees, and land use, and then any other regulations. But you also have an oversight role. So you approve certain contracts and bids, you review reports, you got you know our financial statements today, you saw them, approve them. And so you have, you know, you don't have to be conversant in them, but you should be aware of, of where they are. And you oversee the city manager and you know our our goals and policies being implemented to our satisfaction. We've set out certain goals, are they being done? And you address controversy. Uh, so that's the thing. And then my last note is that the council speaks with one voice. And obviously there are seven of you and you have seven voices and you're going to speak. And uh, I, I hats off to this particular group because you've been exemplary at this all year. But once a decision is made, that's the voice of the council. So, you know, sometimes you're on the winning end and sometimes you're on the losing end of a vote. But once that vote is made, now you all have spoken. And so for me, and our staff and the public, like that's the voice, you know, we're, we go to the minutes, we look at the motion. That's why sometimes someone say, do we need a motion this? I'm like, yes, please. Even if I, it's going to be six zero, like say what you want. So we, we know what the voice is. We can go back to it. City manager, what do I do? Not much, right? Uh, our job and our staff's job is to implement the council's policy. Again, spoken through your plans, your budgets, and all those kind of things to recommend policy to the council. So we are not, policy makers, but we're your professional staff. And so it is our job to tell you what we think, and it's our job to do what you say, even if you didn't agree with what we think, right? Some of you heard my pave the river, right? If you, you know, we can tell you all the reasons why paving the river is a bad idea, but if you say pave the river, we'll be out there paving it. And then two years later, when you say that was a bad idea, we shouldn't do it. It's our job not to say, we told you so. It's just to say, okay, we'll undo it. 
So we provide advice and in, in, information to the council. Uh, I am the chief administrative officer of the city, which is other than the specific appointees that we talked about, all other uh, employees are appointed by me. So I hire, fire, supervise, manage. We deal with constituent services. So it's our job to address the complaints. So if you get them, share them with us. We'll work with you on those. Uh, there is a code of ethics that comes with the International City Managers Association. Uh, I follow that, and I try to insist on that with all of our staff. And I did put a copy of that in your books. Uh, and uh, it's our job to deal with the capacity. So if you're dealing with the vision, the external authorities are our job to deal with the capacity. So then we have council communications. Uh, if you read the charter, it says you can only communicate with staff through the city manager. Uh, obviously, that can be a little bit um, burdensome, and we, we tend to observe that a little loosely. Uh, what we ask is that you inform the manager, copy the manager. Uh, if you're communicating with staff, uh, you know you need to ask Mike a zoning question. Please ask him. I'm not going to know the answer. I just want to know that that conversation happened, and our staff will tell me, you know, I just met with Council Member Gill today, and we talked about zoning. I just want to know what's said so that I don't say the wrong thing or something different in a council meeting. And uh, 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 so, and you can go to staff for inquiry information, uh, and and a staff reply, as many of you see, will typically go to the whole council. Just because one of you has a question doesn't mean the others didn't have the same question. You just didn't think to ask it. So we try to give everybody the same information so that none of you are sitting here in a meeting saying, "Wow, I was told." And the rest of them are saying, how come you told Tim and not the rest of us? Uh, so that's how, how that goes. Um, with each other, your most legal, your best warm communication is in public meetings with each other. If You certainly can talk to one another outside meetings. It would be crazy to think that you don't. Um, be very careful not to create a quorum, which is four, people, four of you together. You better be talking about you know the weather. Uh, and not city business. So just be conscious of that because that's when that's when things happen by accident that shouldn't happen. Um, so don't create a quorum. You do not use email to discuss council business. Now again, that's kind of a, a work of art. You certainly can raise an issue by email. If somebody says, "I'd like to," you know, "I'm concerned about this. I'd like this on the agenda." That's great. Everyone else should not be responding and saying, "Well, here's what we should do about it." Right? That's just when you say, "Okay, good to know that." Palin has this concern. I'll be thinking about it before the next meeting, so I'll be ready to talk about it. Uh, if you get complaints from the public, you know, obviously acknowledge the receipt and be clear when if you're responding to people or the press or anything, whether you're speaking for yourself or 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 the full council. And I put an asterisk on that because there may be a time when typically the mayor would speak for the full council or the manager would speak on behalf of the full council. Um but there might be a time when, for whatever reason, we've designated somebody else just because they might have certain expertise or they're on that committee or whatever. And we'd say, hey, listen, if there's any inquiries about this, you know, uh, Carrie, would you be the spokesperson on this issue? But so in that case, you would say, I've been designated to speak for the council on this. Otherwise, you'd say, I'm one council member. This is my opinion. This is not the position of the council. Just because because people will misinterpret that. They hear it from you. They will think that because you told them that, that is the rule. And so it's just being clear. And again, all all electronic communications are public records. So any questions about roles and that kind of thing? Including texts and emails. Yeah. Including texts and emails. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, that's right. They're all anything written. Voicemails. Yeah. Letters, notes, yep. emails, texts. Yeah. Just. Okay. Talk a little bit about policy because that is really your job. You know, we use this airplane. So if you think about it, you choose your destination, you choose the arrival time, choose the cost. So when you're when you're going on a trip, right, you can just say, all right, I'm going to go to California. I don't care when I get there. I don't care what month I go. And I don't care if I have to make seven stops along the way. I just want the cheapest price, right? Or you could say, I want to go first class. I need to get there nonstop today. I'm willing to pay top dollar. So as you are setting your goals, it's like, okay, what do we want to do? How fast are we going to get there? And are we willing to sort of shell out big money or we will do this, but we, we're doing it incrementally. We're going to try to be conservative with our funding. How urgent is this? So you think about these things. What are, where are we trying to get to? How fast do we want to get there? And how much are we willing to invest in resources? I uh, stole this from a colleague. 
but it, it took the airline thing and really does have a, do a nice job of sort of showing the handoff between the council and the the staff where you know you're at the beginning the purpose and vision that's what you're really saying here's what we're trying to do we talk about our goals yep so we want housing i'll just use that one for example we want housing okay we're going to buy this property we're going to go through these things we're going to set these priority actions and at some point you know it becomes a planning project and it becomes a project and we're updating you and how that's going but you've set the parameters and then we go and do it and you know so by the end by the time we're landing the job you know you've you've already said you're on to the next thing you're already thinking about the next project we're finishing the last um so this is the vision statement that you all approved uh last november or december again it's in your book so I won't read it uh and then this was the mission statement that you approved and then the core values that we approved again just recently and we can uh, vision those and again those sort of drive the overview of where we're going so the strategic plan uh, we try to do that annually either an update or a full review is usually has re most recently been done in september or october with a march check-in if there's a change like some of you remember we had three new people last year so we did a check-in and you all said yep we're good for now till we get back to it and it's an iterative process between council and staff often facilitated and we established that final plan is adopted by the council and then once that's done, that guides our agenda items, projects, and activities, and we issue you quarterly reports on how we're doing. So why do this? Basically, um, you know, you've heard this before. If you add up the number of meetings we have and how long they normally last, it's about 125 total hours per year that you're sitting in this room as a council. So if you if those are work weeks, that's three weeks of work. So how how do you use this time sitting in these chairs doing this work? the best what's the best use of your time you're you know you're not scraping the sidewalks you're not doing these things how do you how do you use the thing and these are Stephen Covey's quadrants right the what's important and what's urgent and um, obviously you want to be focused on quadrants one and two the stuff that has to happen and get done and specifically what's urgent it's not urgent it doesn't have to be on today but it needs to be done so how do we spend our time planning um, quadrant three you should be saying yep how, you know, staff take care of it. And if it's not important and not urgent, maybe we ought to just get rid of it or it certainly should be in this meeting. So, uh, so you focus on important leadership issues and you provide clarity uh, on your goals and mission and, and direction. I'm not going to read all these, but these are the current strategic plans goals. They build and, in, and maintain infrastructure to create more housing to rebuild and plan for future resilience, face of climate change and good environmental stewardship, improve community prosperity for residents and local businesses whose basic needs are met, uh, and improve public health and safety for all. We kind of have an unofficial sixth goal, which is provide responsible and engaged government that had been a goal. You didn't add it this year, but it still, I think, guides a lot of what we do. So I kind of put it as a little subcategory there. Um, so there's that's that. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. Uh, the budget. So basically our budget, we just completed that. So the strategic plan sets the priorities. In October, we meet, we give you some very preliminary projections. Uh, at that point, you can set whatever targets, goals, or priorities that you desire that either are the same as the strategic plan or different. We start working in, in earnest on the budget in, in November. We have what we call budget Congress, which is basically when the staff gets together and, and uh, decides what will be in the budget that gets proposed to you. I present that budget to you in December, and then you hold hearings uh, in December and January, you usually approve the budget for the ballot in late January. There's a statutory deadline. And then residents vote on the budget on the first Tuesday of March, and it begins and takes effect July 1st. And that process goes round and round. And so uh, that's that's it for now. And again, we just went through this. So again, with policy, I think, stealing from different people uh begin with the end in mind that's another stephen covey so as we launch things what are what are we trying to do right so what what's the goal here is it create more housing is it to do this thing so what's what what's we doing uh this is just a management consultant that i know i heard him do a presentation and he asked this question i thought it was great so what good for which people at which cost what difference do you make what are the outcomes you desire the kind of things to be thinking of so who's benefiting who's paying what difference will it make at the end? 
and then putting first things first and using, you know, effective leadership is putting first things first. So picking what the top priorities are, the management is carrying it out. And then Brene Brown, uh, clarity is kind. Um, that, that sometimes people don't like clarity, but it's kind because then people know what's going on. And I like that one. We use that one a lot. So any questions about policy making? I know I'm really buzzing through this, and but I also am aware of the time. <laughs> okay. So facilities, operations, and projects. This is now getting more to the bottom part of the iceberg. Uh, this is just a list of city facilities. It's in your, you've got it, so I'm not going to read them, but, um, but there's a th lot. There's a lot. So these are things that the city owns, manages, runs, operates, <laughs> and is responsible for. So uh, again, some of these are, are below the iceberg, but there are things that will come up and are things that occasionally need repair and funding or your attention. Uh, we're certainly happy to provide tours and visits. We wouldn't take you to all of these, but we certainly take you to some of the, the highlights. Um, and again, our operations, so public safety, our police, fire, EMS, emergency management, all these things, public works, uh, community services, parks, rec and seniors, planning and development, city clerk, finance office, and the city manager. And uh, the cemetery commission, of course, is independent and maintain the cemeteries. Very briefly, the organization chart. Again, you have all this. And here's, um, so just so you have a sense of what we're doing, because I think sometimes there's always an idea of we want to keep doing more, but we're doing a lot. So these are our current projects that are either underway or in, in the queue under our infrastructure goals. We've set a goal for improving infrastructure. These are the things that we're already uh, working on the capital plan, the water and sewer plan implementation that you just uh, approved, whether or not to have a stormwater utility, a stump dump. We just met with the state today. All these other projects are in various states of completion or planning or whatever. So um, we are certainly working on our infrastructure goal. Looking at our housing goal, obviously the Country Club Road is the biggest one. The zoning revisions are related to that, that you're almost done. Uh, after that, we'll be completing the city plan, which then starts talking about looking forward to the next iteration of things we want to do. And then coming to you uh, relatively soon now, be 12 to 16 Main Street. The, the property that we own is finally cleared all of its legal hurdles. And so, uh, not legal hurdles, but the subdivisions and the, all the things that needed to happen. So it's ready for us to do what we want to do with it. So we'll have a discussion about that in an upcoming agenda. Uh, a prior council approved uh, a plan for it. We're just going to make sure that the current council is on board with that plan, and then we will go ahead. Uh, rebuild and resiliency goal. Obviously, the biggest thing is our FEMA projects, just rebuilding all the things that got wrecked and putting them all back together. We also have our net zero plan implementation, our district heat, uh, trying to work on customer expense ex expansion and, and making that more financially uh, viable, the Emerald Ash Borer response. We will be having the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience recommendations coming to us at some point in the future. Uh, so we know that. And then we have grants in uh, for the 55 Berry Street, the rec center systems upgrade. So if we get that grant, that will be something we will be doing to take a terrible building and make it a little bit better and be more energy efficient. Um, and in our advanced economy goal, we have an outdoor recreation plan. We're just launching our recreation needs assessment to figure out what we should be doing about rec facilities, and particularly if we're going to try to do something at Country Club Road. We have a downtown master plan that was adopted uh, certainly pre-COVID, um, and I think it needs to be updated, implemented, because it was really designed to be done when um, the the uh, State Street Bridge, the uh, Rialto Bridge was going to be replaced. The idea is that street's going to be closed down. That's the time to do big sidewalk, street, scape improvements. We've got streets closed anyway. Let's be ready for it. And we did an extensive plan, and we want to make sure that it still meets today's needs and wants, and also to sort of reacquaint people, the public, with what that is and for. To, to may recall, that was actually the 12th to 16 Main Street site was part of that. And... Uh, there's the Berry Street cycle track uh, still under consideration and Dog River Path extension. And public health and safety, we are still obviously shelter for unhoused persons is a big deal. Public restroom is still a big deal. 
We are actively still trying to do the regional public safety infrastructure. We're still pursuing funding from the state. We have a lost fire truck that we are. Hopefully we have a lead on a replacement. We do need to plan for a uh, fire tower replacement, update our ambulance replacement schedule. We are working on our crisis intervention team uh, actively and uh, we have a flood after action recommendation. So a lot going on with that goal as well. And then again, the non-goal of uh, responsible and engaged government, we, we will be updating our communications plan. You know, a key part of it had been using the bridge and using the Times Argus, and we won't be doing that after July. So we're going to be taking a look at how we're going to be doing that differently. We've got some IT infrastructure that needs to be upgraded. We are working on very specific work plans with all our departments, uh, which will be folded into the strategic plans. We're doing some benchmarking with, these are things that are more internal, but you'll probably hear about them. Just so you know, I mean, these are the kind of things that happen that you don't necessarily know about, but they're all going on. Uh, we're doing some HR improvements and updates on how our systems can work better. We're trying to improve our budget tracking, our grants management intern, and just a bunch of internal processes. So we're really taking that on. Um, so those are the kind of things we're doing. So any questions about city operations? Again, you'll have more time to do that, but if there's in general about how they function. Get it. So what's going to happen next? And I think this is really probably ties into all of this is our plan, unless you tell me otherwise, is over the next several meetings, we're going to focus on one goal uh, and do a deep dive so that you can take a look at you've set this goal and we can talk about the initiatives, strategies for trying to, you know, we, we had to rush the strategic plan. And so this will be a chance to come back to it and talk to it when it's less rushed. And you know, in addition, we're going to tie a department overview uh, with it so that you get it. Again, we did the quick run through during budget. This will be a chance for a little bit more expansive explanation and a chance to ask maybe questions about the department. And again, without the budget sword hanging over us, but a chance to find out and talk about department's future needs and those kind of things. So the plan is we we'll just teed them up in the order of the goals as you had prioritized them. So March 27, our next meeting, will focus on the infrastructure goal and DPW will be here to do their interview, their overview. And it's, you know, they're a large department, so they, they're kind of the equivalent of two or three departments when they go through all their things. The following meeting, we'll be doing the housing goal and that will include the planning and development overview, which is perfect that you put the zoning there. Uh, so that ties, that's why we were, when Mike and I were saying, that's, aren't you on for the third? That's what we were talking about. Uh, April 17th, we will be doing the rebuild and resiliency goal. Uh, the Montpelier Commission on Resiliency and Re Recovery has agreed they will come in to provide loop data on their activities and our sustainability cord, and we'll talk about some of their activities. There's obviously more, this is the shorthand. The May 8th is be the economy goal. Uh, so we'll hear from Montpelier Live, Parks, Rec, uh, those kinds of, actually, I think I may have moved up. Anyway, whatever. And then the health and safety goal. So that's what we'll do, police, fire, and the Justice Center. And then lastly, again, the, the non-goal uh, uh, responsible government. So we'll go through the manager, clerk, finance, IT, HR, all those kinds of things. And we, one of the things we talked about during budget, I think during my review, was then beginning a conversation of what are our core services as we we kind of go into the summer, we're going to come out of the summer. That's all of a sudden budget will be a month or two away. So one of, we, we talked a lot about in the budget about, uh, I know it seems crazy, right? Uh, but that's how it rolls. Um, we talked a lot about, we got to fund core services, but you know, core services mean different things to different people. So how do we as a group decide what we think are the key things that, that are important and um, in, in how do we prioritize so that when we go into budget, we're all in a better shape that we've got a clearer idea of our mission. So that is the plan for the next what, one, two, three, four, five, six meetings it will be centered around these things. Obviously other things will pop up like the zoning hearing and those kind of things that need to be dealt with, but we're going to really try to keep the, your time focused on policy things that you should really be digging into. You know, last year we lost half a year because of a flood. And so we were just getting into the swing of things with three new members and then we just kind of lost it. So well, now we, everyone's got a year into their belt except for 
Councilmember Gill, and we have a chance to sort of do the work that we didn't get a chance to do last year. So uh, the Teddy Roosevelt quote, the man in the arena, uh, please, please don't mind the uh, sexist language. It was from 1909, but uh, I think the sentiment's important. It's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. Credit goes to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, comes up short again and again, and spends himself at a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. And I say this because you are the people in the arena. You're going to hear all sorts of criticism this year. You did last year. You will next year. Uh, there are folks, and and you know that's fine. We're a government. We deserve that. But you're the ones that stepped up to do it, and you're making tough decisions. And you are either daring greatly, failing spectacularly, or doing things. But that's that's the risk. And and the, the Monday morning quarterbacks will be there. But um, so I think it's just. Uh, you know, we begin with the Athenian Oath and we end with Teddy Roosevelt. So any questions about any of this? What's that? Great presentation. Thank you. Well, I got it down to under an hour this year. You know, Bill, we I don't know how much of this we did last year. I wasn't able to, to be at them, but I think this might be a good year to try to do, set up tours for... Yep. The facilities and offices, you know, yes. visit the fire department, the police department, the public right. works facilities, all that stuff. Right. No, absolutely. And uh, there are a lot of them, but you certainly police, fire, the public works facilities, the, the treatment plants, those kind of things, um, rec facilities. Parks and rec, yeah. Parks, you know, I mean, you could, the list can go on, but certainly the big expensive things, that, you know, because people don't understand, right? Until some of you I know have done them. Until you see the dispatch center and you see what the people are doing, you know, you don't. It's, it just gives you a different perspective. The water plant, the wastewater plant. Uh, so it's it's you know it's helpful. I remember one time, one year we did tour bus. We actually got a little like one of those, and we brought everyone together. And we warned it as a public meeting. We had some members of the public came, hmm. and uh, this was a while ago. Now Steve Gray was still here as the public works director. And all the way, we had a resident was here and all the way up, we were going to the water treatment plant. He was just all over us about why we needed three people to run the place. We got there, we ran the tour and on the whole way back, he's like, how do you do it with only three people? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think it, it helps to, to get those uh, pieces informed. Uh, yes, tours are, are important. And then obviously I will stop talking. Yeah. Oh, your charge for yeah. the tours? Uh, it's like a little bit, right? Charge for tours of things that people already it's pay like, for. <laughs> like museums, yeah, right? Maybe. It's a non-profit. Yeah, there we charge. go. There we go. Well, I think the most important thing is for you all to get acquainted. And I know that the staff loves to have visitor council visitors because they like to, to talk and they're proud of what they do and they want to be able to talk about it. So, uh, and help you get that perspective. So I'm going to stop then. Um, just going to stop sharing and stop talking and um we can move on to set a retreat i guess is the next thing so thank you for listening thank you for doing what you do everything i said is in the book i gave you and the outline is in in the packet so it's all there if you have any questions at any time about anything do not hesitate to, to text call email weekends whatever you know i'll get back to you as soon as i can so you are my most important external approving authority so Thanks, Bill. This is great. Having even having seen it before, I think it's it's a great reminder of what we're doing and why. Set a date for the retreat. So here we are. Yeah. So in the years past, we've had a council retreat where we didn't talk about those things. The hundred and twenty-five we did not talk about policy. We really talked about getting to know one another better. I mean, maybe the big picture, sort of what people were interested in. 
and how to, you know, how we function best. Every group is different. Some people like to receive information differently. Some people like to communicate differently. Just kind of what are our rules of engagement? What works for us? What doesn't work for us? Uh, how do we want to, you know, are we happy with outlining the agendas the way they are? Is there things we'd like change procedurally, those kind of things. So it's the one time to really focus on the function of the council and the staff uh, typically. So we, you know, we can do them wherever. The only rule is that, you know, it is still a public meeting has to be warned. And so it has to be a place that is, you know, accessible meets accessibility requirements. Um, you know, in the years past, we've done them in the, the police community room. We can't do that now because the planning office is set up in there, but you know, the library, you can, we, you know, we really wherever, and sometimes it's good to get out of this room to do it. I think so. Just the, it's a different dynamic. Sit around a table somewhere and and do that. So, but I think once if you want to pick a time that you all can do it, we can figure out a place. So that would be you know, and you could just say we either want to be in here or we want to be somewhere else, and we'll we'll take it from there. So. And I think it, to me it makes sense it's to typically. Do I and the assistant manager have been involved, but mm -hmm. that's also, the, and sometimes it's facilitated. And to me, it makes sense to do it like on, on an off week. <laughs> How long do you figure it takes to get prepared for it? Uh, you know, I think a lot of it depends on what you want to take on. Is you know, Do we want to have, I mean, they are good when you have a facilitator because then everyone you know, then everyone can participate. The mayor doesn't have to run the meeting and can be an equal participant. So that, you know, we'd have to line someone up and find a space and those kind of things. But I don't know. Nope. I, within a month, I would think we could do that. I mean, the sooner we do it, the better. Because, you know, last year we didn't get to it and then summer comes and then a flood come. And, and, right. And then it didn't happen. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to put it on the very first agenda. So. Yep. Well, let's see. Yeah, I'm thinking in April, we changed our, our meeting dates. So we're not, are we doing the third and the uh, seventh, third and the 24th or? We're doing the third and the 17th. Third and the 17th, okay. So we would have the 10th and the 24th free if we wanted to stick well, with but the there were con There were conflicts for the 10th and 24th. That's why we why did that. Moved okay. Them. Yep. You would have May 1st where you had a meeting on April 17th and then not another one until May 8th. Mm -hmm. so that, might, that might be worth doing. And so that gives us one to have to get it locked up. Until the same time, that's 6.30? Yeah, I'm just like checking. That's right. We could, people yeah, we could do food too. Four, Good stuff. You do? I won't. <laughs> <laughs> all, of, all of your committees happen to meet. The, the ones that only meet once a year, they're all meeting that day. <laughs> Yeah, same here. That's why I asked. Maybe we can meet a little bit early, maybe 5.30 instead of 6.30. So I don't know. Yeah. That works. works for me. Yeah. So, it's very unusual. So 5.30, May 1st, okay, food and a facility. Yeah. And a location. Mm -hmm. All right. And it uh, seems to me at one point we were thinking about, well, would Cameron want to do that? Please. Smart cookie or on in her own right. All right. Yeah. To, to midnight. Midnight. Okay. Yeah. I will just like plug <laughs> it. Good. I think facilitators a little different. What some do, just so you know, some may call each of you. Some like to because they like to get an idea of what people want to talk about so that they help form the agenda ahead of time so that it's it's useful. So I will let you know once we line someone up, we'll let you know. And if they plan to do that, you can mm -hmm. expect a call. Cool. Great.
Well, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll see. Kind. Maybe maybe we'll hear from Lauren that she's not available, and then we'll we'll okay. have to figure that out. She's she's, she's she had to get off the meeting. She's yeah, you know, long time ago. So yeah. Yep. So council reports start at your end. To report, I just want to say welcome to um, Councillor Gill and congratulations, uh, Carrie Sell and uh, Jack. That's all. That's it. Let <laughs> me take on the cue from the presentation. A topic I'd like to get on an agenda, but looking at the agenda topics is like, I don't know where we're going to fit it in. <laughs> but the, the PFAS is still a concern for me. And with the news, with what happened in Coventry with Casella recently, um, it sounds like the filtration system won't be up and running till June or July. Um, maybe a conversation on our end about, I think Kurt twice sent out a note that said that we're not accepting any right now. Um, but just a conversation about for how long and, and what our standards are. Because I think after our last conversation, it was late at night and ended. Kevin, I, when it came out after, I just remembered it a little differently. So I'd love to finish that. Yep. So. Um. I just want to just wanted to say that uh, I, I'm back for for a reason. I <laughs> I I learned a lot in that first year, and uh, I'm happy to be back. It was it was uh, fun working with this group. I mean, uh, um, considering the long list of intractable problems that we've you know facing us, um, I think we all get along pretty well. We don't always agree on stuff, but the process seems to work. We know where it has to be improved, I think, but um, I want to thank everybody for that. It was a good year for me, and um, I'm ready for two more, I guess. Thanks. Uh, so I'm also happy to be back here and reelected and um, taking on a second term, and I want to welcome Adrian to join our group. Um, and uh, this morning, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee had a meeting, and one of the things we talked about was a proposal to change the stipend policy that's a, that we currently have to expand it a bit and broaden it a bit. So I will be, they have a written proposal that I will be hoping we can get onto an agenda as soon as we can. Um, the committee recognizes that the stipends are not in the budget for next year, but wants to still have to make a, the best use of the time that we have left with that money in the budget and also to um, hopefully look to the future when we can bring that back, you know, not assuming it's gone forever. And so in the meantime, to try to make as good a policy as we can. So you'll be seeing that soon. Great. Well, thank you all for the warm welcome. I'm excited to be here. Um, one thing that's been on my mind the past like week <laughs> um, and just listening to the constituents over the past uh, month and especially after tonight, I wanted to, this is my first time ever proposing anything or sharing my thoughts with this group. So tell me if I'm doing this wrong, <laughs> um, was to think about adding a new committee to our long list of committees, um, if we have to add this to an agenda, but thinking about opportunities of volunteers to pull together a grant funding committee. Um, there's a lot, my background, I've uh, grant, wrote, wrote a lot of grants. I've written federal grants, state grants, nonprofit grants, brought in 50, $60 million to organizations. And I think there's a huge opportunity for our city to look at diverse funding opportunities. Um, and it ties into our core services, right? Like, what are we funding? What do we not fund? So I think this is could potentially be a big project and a big undertaking. But I know the staff doesn't have the capacity to do all the research. And the folks that I've talked to in the community are super excited to be charged with that task. So um, I would love to capture that energy and that excitement and and propose, you know, on an agenda that we form a committee that focuses on grant writing and fundraising for the city. Cool. Okay. Um, 
it's to me a couple of things. One, uh, thank you to the voters for returning me to this position. I'm, uh, I certainly didn't know whether I was going to be reelected or not. And uh, I appreciate the vote of confidence. And we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And I'm happy to still be here doing it. Um, and thanks to the my fellow counselors for <clears throat> running again or and running and be, and being ready to do the work. Um, I got a couple of other things to mention. One, I I just got a notice recently of a of a new movie uh, directed by Bess O'Brien called Just Getting By. Uh, that it focuses on Vermonters dealing with food and housing insecurity, and it's going to be shown in a variety of places, including at the Savoy Theater on April 12th. And so uh, I think that, and I think there's another day in April that I'm not seeing, but but I think that that's something that uh, people in Montpelier deal with just like people in other parts of the state. And so I think it's it's going to be worthwhile. And I also want to take a moment to uh, remember Ken Liebertoff, who who just died. And Ken, uh, some of you may have known him. Ken spent uh, many years working in in or adjacent to the area that I work in, which is uh, working for services and rights of people with uh, psychiatric diagnoses. And uh, Ken was tireless in doing the work and was always uh, able to maintain a sense of uh, humor and uh, and human connection while doing it. And uh, so he will be missed. And I see the city clerk has turned his light on, so it's time for his report. Well, first of all, I want to thank the voters, too, for electing me to uh... Uh, however many terms this is, uh, I always appreciate the support, and it's it was great to see. Um, I'm glad that uh, the Board of Abatement and Board of Civil Authority have been mentioned as part of the uh, council's responsibilities. Those are not optional responsibilities. You all are on that board and boards, and so many of you have been doing such a good job slogging through it the last few last few months, several months. And uh, in terms of that coming up, we're going to have a though the flood abatement requests are still coming in. So we're going to have meetings with the Board of Abatement on the 28th and whatever the following Thursday is, which I don't have in front of me. But okay. those are going to be coming right up to that deadline that we have under statute for April 15th to have all these requests in. Uh, to get the assistance on the education portion of the tax abatement. So it'll be really important to have them. We do have Capital Plaza, for example, which is probably the biggest single question mark we have to, to address. Uh, so yes, please try to make those. We do have to have a majority of the council there to constitute a quorum. As far as the Board of Civil Authority goes, uh, there is another election coming up. It has not been formally set, but informally it's going to be on April 30th, and that'll be to consider whatever new budget the um, the school comes up with. Um, the guidance from the Secretary of State is no longer that this is an extension of a previous election, but is a standalone election, which means if any of you all watched the uh, school board uh, meeting that I was at, I informed them that we would need to be sending absentee ballots automatically to everyone who voted early um, for the previous election. That is no longer their guidance. So this will be a standalone election, and folks who want early ballots will need to request them. And there will be, since I have um, moved from the authority in the past for things like tabulating ballots early from previous authorizations for town meeting day for the Board of Civil Authority. Since this is a different election, we may need to have a Board of Civil Authority meeting to authorize me to do that again. Should I even choose to do that, it might might not be uh, might not be called for this time. But anyways, I will be in touch. I will also get you all copies, since it is a new election, of the folks who've been registered or uh, 
removed from the, the roles since then. I'm overdue in getting that to you anyways. Um, so that's, I think that covers your BCA and your BOA stuff. And other than that, um, I don't think I have anything else. Cool. Right up to you. Yep. Thanks. I haven't talked much tonight. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, good news. Uh, today, the governor did sign the Budget Adjustment Act. Um, so while it was not perfect and did not contain everything we would have hoped, it did contain $825,000 for the city to help offset our revenue losses for this current fiscal year. So we'll be giving some thought and come back to you with a proposal for how we would allocate that. As you know, we cut a lot of projects and delayed a lot of purchases and those kind of things and have not filled some vacancies. Um, so we'll take a look at how that all works uh, and with some thoughts. Uh, we are still pushing for an additional, we had asked for 1.3 million. That is what you all had cut in the budget this year uh, to, to rescind from the budget. So we're asking for another 475,000 to get us from 825 to 1.3 million. And we continue to push for the $2 million for elevations and dealing with the properties. We do believe that if we can get the money in our hands, we can turn it around uh, much more fast efficiently and faster than uh, FEMA can and uh, others. And so uh, we'll see uh, where, where they go. I know the state has, uh, particularly the administration has been pretty, uh, they, they want to help, but they've also been, you know, kind of, I think, take, I, understandably, I don't really want to criticize them, but hey, that's what FEMA's for. That's what that's money for. Why should we put up state money? But it's the time. It's time versus money. And particularly, you know, with cases like we heard tonight where people are really living in, in tough situations. So how can we we help? So we're continuing to push for that. Uh, so there's that. We learned just today. Uh, and so I don't know really anything about this, but our big changes in the hotel program coming at the end of the month. Um, and I got a call from Representative Casey saying they're, there was going to be some kind of grouping of like 100 people in near Berlin and Montpelier. He wasn't sure where, so we're still trying to learn more about that. I don't know if you've heard about this yet, Chief. Um, maybe National Guard Armory, maybe something off Dog River, not sure. So uh, what's that? Is it this Friday? I wasn't sure. Oh, it's this Friday. End of the week. Okay. No, sorry, end of the week. You're right. I said end of the month. So those are hot off the press, and we have not really been included in the planning on all of that. So... Uh, more to come and we will keep you as informed as we can I've already mentioned you got you do updated handbooks and I would also say welcome to uh, council member Gill welcome back to all of you and thank you for running and for doing these jobs because we don't have a local government without you so appreciate it oh I, I realized there was something else I should have mentioned under my report you know people hear about criticism for, of our public uh employees and i also have a bit of praise for public employees uh on town meeting day when i was out parked across the street i uh wound up getting a parking ticket and uh, <clears throat> it was obvious it was my car it was the car with my uh, magnets on the side and someone pointed out to the agent well you know that's the mayor's car and she said well i'd give a parking ticket to the president if he was parked uh, <laughs> over time and and I think well that's that's great that's exactly what they're supposed to be doing so nobody is usually happy about getting a parking ticket but I'm very happy about not getting special treatment and not getting a parking ticket when I deserved one. Did your campaign pack pay for the ticket? Oh uh, no, what what Tim? <laughs> do you have to do you have to put that on your campaign expense disclosure form? Paid for the, by the super PAC or? Yes, I'll just pay it out of pocket. <laughs> and with nothing more, we are adjourned at ten forty-four p.m. Thanks, folks.